Tonight on the Online Wine Tasting Club, as well as trying to cook in a winery that only has one electric ring, we find out all about chickens. We've got chickens in the garden, so I just pick my favourite chicken. Do not have favourites? We get told off by a five-year-old. What's this? It's good for your wine tasting. You think this is better than what I cook? Yeah. Oh. And Alex treats Jamie, the award winner, with the respect that he truly deserves. So I'm going to go drink this in the corner, but it's a pleasure. Hold on, Jamie. <laughs> it's time to have a good old cook along and talk all about food and wine pairing with the Adventurer series. Good evening and welcome to our little food and wine cook-along pairing jobby malarkey. We're here and that's the main thing and so are you and you aren't watching Eurovision, which I think is a good thing. But um, but yeah, it's it's a pleasure to, to join you tonight um, for a little bit of a discussion about what makes food and wine work so well together and, and it does, doesn't it? No, absolutely. So what we're going to do at the very beginning is uh, we're just going to put a little, little poll up for you. Um, just so we can see who is cooking along, who doesn't care about our cook along, <laughs> who's just drinking the wine, and who's uh, and the, just so we can kind of tailor it. Because if there's lots of people cooking along, we'll spend a little bit more time, make sure everyone's got their food. And if nobody's cooking along, we'll just get drinking. Well, I do know that we've already heard from a few people who are watching Eurovision or other concerts that are going on tonight, and who are going to be joining us on YouTube. So, but yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a great thing, and we we just hope that. Uh, if you've got another phone or something, you can use this Poly V thing that we've got. That uh, um, the link is at the bottom of the screen: towtc.co.uk/taste, and that's where you can enter your tasting notes as we go along. And we need it because we need you guys to tell us who has picked the winning combination of food and wine. Me. Well, he would say that because there is a bit of a, an advantage here, having grown up all of his life in the catering industry, but. I have grown up all my life eating food and drinking wine, so that doesn't. doesn't you said rather said we've both grown up, which is a lie. Um, <laughs> so um, we've got some bits and pieces going. So um, if you are if you are doing the um, doing the cook along, it's probably a good time to get. Well, let's get wise one or two in the glass first, and mm. maybe if you're watching from a distance, get your get your your batter whipped up for your pancakes. Um, we're very Blue Peter style here. Yeah, we should we should give just a little description because obviously you've got the list of ingredients and you've got the recipe, but but it's really just a question of making sure you, you sift that flour in there, get your egg cracked in. You don't even need to have your own chicken for this, some say. Um, bit of baking powder, perhaps a bit of seasoning if you fancy that, and then the dill and the chard um, into that mixture. Give it a good of a mix. And then we'll all get back together and we'll put it in a pan because I'm going to attempt to... Uh, Cook, cook. Li live. Yeah, we live. We... <laughs> and if you're doing the chicken, hopefully you followed our instructions. Your chicken is in the oven. I'm seeing some people. Um, actually, there are a good number of people cooking on. That's fantastic That's to see. So thank you guys for phenomenal taking a bit of a gamble on that. So there's a lot of us in the studio today. We've uh, we've decided we're going to do in the studio. We want your feedback. We want to talk about food and wine pairing, all that kind of stuff. So we've only got a couple of little uh, little interviewee kind of bits here, and we kind of timed it that we can do an interview while we have a bite to eat. But food and wine pairing um, can be very scary. What should I pair with it? You know, you walk into a restaurant and you pick up this wine list that's 763 pages long with 9,422 wines in there. And there's a, a restaurant list with all these weird ingredients that you've never heard of. And you go, holy hell, what do I do? Yeah. What do you do? Well, I mean, the first thing to do is, obviously, in these situations, if you're in a really posh restaurant, probably the best place to do is to actually ask the guys who work there. They, it's a stupid thing to say, but, but do trust them. And also, if they suggest something that is not something you like, then please don't, don't just feel any compulsion. Say, actually, I don't like that. Could, could you maybe think of something else? Or I don't like red wine. Say that. And they will very, very happily think of an alternative. And if they don't, they're probably not very good at their job, are they? Or give it a go, because you never know. You might think, you know, we've done lots of these tastings and people go, oh, I don't really like red wine, but I really like that yeah, one. Yeah, that is true. So yeah. not, all, not all red wines are created equally, but um, there we go. But no, what, what's important is what we're going to do is we're going to taste these wines and, and see what you think. Obviously, you should vote that I, I pick the better wine, because that keeps me very, very happy. He's quite predictable, isn't he? <laughs> 
<laughs> Dear me. Um, so what we're going to do? So for, with with our with our first rounds, we've got a, we're doing a little smoked salmon on these dill pancakes, a little bit of creme fraiche. Um, and once we've done that, and we come back into the studio, we'll talk a little bit about the different components. You know that we talk about the the acid, the umami, all that kind of stuff. But I thought it would be important just to get you know drinking a little bit. Um, so we've got wine one and two in the glass. We're going to introduce them the other way round um, because I I had the chance to talk with. Um, with the uh, the winemaker at Grace Winery over in Japan, um, so we were going to have that kind of run through while we had a little bit of a bite to eat. So um, Alex has picked a um, something white um, that he <laughs> thinks might go with salmon. Um, so he's going to tell you a little bit about this. Um, then we'll do a little bit of a cookie cook cook. Yeah, sure. And then we'll um, drink some more wine. Fair enough. That sounds good. Well, I mean. Sancerre, what, what is there to say about it? It's an utter, utter classic. Actually, can you remember which is which, by the way? Because I didn't pour these. So the one that's, <laughs> the one that's number one, yep, is that the, is best one the best okay. one is that. Your, your, your one is... To be, to be honest, um, we laugh and we jest. Every wine we pick is meant to be I think, great and I delicious. Think so so yeah. when, when I knock it, it's about his picks. It's not oh, about no, the quality no. of the wine. And um, oh, Sancerre, obviously, it is a, it's a Sauvignon Blanc, and it is from the Loire Valley. Now, this is, there's a very famous hill right in the centre of the town, and uh, this, this actual winery overlooks that hill. The vineyards, are, they're about, about 12 hectares, so it's, it's quite a small operation. But it's a family-run thing by, um, by Jean-Marie Reverdy and Fils, his son. So it's, uh, it's been several generations that are leading on to this. But um, they've got such a different style for this wine. It's so classic. It's an elegant wine. And we've got subtle flavours with the smoked salmon. And uh, it's got acidity, which works beautifully. Just so you think that little bit of lemon juice that we squeeze on at the end, that acidity in the wine will pair nicely with the acidity in the, in the lemon juice. They like to keep things really, really fresh by going for nice low temperature ferments in, in lots of stainless steel they use. And um, I just, I just, you know, what, I, I, I have to say, what more do you say? Sancerre, there are good examples and there are not so good examples, but I think this, this for me is as classic as mm. classic gets in the Sonso world. Yeah. You've got this baked apple, this touch of tropical, this green herbaceousness, this beautiful minerality running through it. Yeah, but the, the Bright... herbaceousness is suppressed when you compare it to some of those, you know, the, the New World Sauvignon Blanc. So much that it's barely recognisable in many ways. And I don't think that herbaceousness would work so nicely with a, with a, with a, with with a, a smoked salmon. Like yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Which is why you never put herbs with smoked salmon. Oh, no, well, you do sometimes. But you don't put freshly cut grass um, with smoked salmon. So generally often. And, and that oh, might do, be some do. new nouvelle cuisine technique <laughs> exactly. that I'm missing. But, but uh, yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's, got, it's got lots of fruit. It's got obviously lots of the sort of citrus fruits in there. But it's going into some slightly tropical ones. You're, you're starting to get things like a little bit of pineapple coming through. And even maybe some sort of apricot stone. Sorry, I had to get that in there because of Eurovision apparently. So... Is that the winning song for that, tonight? Well, no, that was a winning song of, well, a not winning song a few years back, but a very famous one where a lady was dancing around an apricot stone. But uh, there is, there certainly is that tropical, that ripe fruit in there. And uh, I think it's really delicious. Mm. But delicious is one thing. It's going to be how it goes with this salmon when we all plate it up. So um, perhaps we should start making some pancakes. Let's now, do that. If you've just got some blinis at home, that works perfectly. But uh, yeah, uh, Jamie is going to go and get a pan. Which and then is an we, important part. we may well be going to Food Cam. Food Cam, yeah, indeed. Um, we get a bit of a reflection, but don't worry about that. It will be gone in a moment. Yeah, so um, we only have one electric ring in this. Uh, we want to get a little bit of heat in the pan because we want it to. Um, activate the, the baking powder and the, the self-raising flour. We've got this beautiful mixture of these, this dill, which are a, a gorgeous herb to go with fish, isn't it? And, it's um, lovely. Yeah, really nice. So while Jamie's going to do some cooking, I'm going to come and fix the uh, camera. So here we go, into the pan, a couple of little tablespoons, my, my inner Gordon Ramsay coming out here. We just let that sit, a little bit of heat. And then we wait. This is the joy of this. But um, while, while we're waiting, I'll talk a little, a little bit about the koshu. Um, so, absolutely phenomenal wine. And koshu is it's an indigenous grape. When we talk about Japanese wine, I think a lot of people run to sake, which is, which is a rice wine. Uh, koshu is made with a, a particular 
uh, grape, which, you know, Koshu is the grape, and it's a uh, vinifera grape, which is, you know, when you talk about Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc or whatever it is, that's the, uh, the grape that it's, um, the grape species, which is important. Um, but what's great about this is it wasn't classed as vinifera for a long, 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 long time. Um, they kept um, it being something a bit different. It was a wild grape, whatever. Um, but it's their very, very own grape. It's not really grown anywhere else in the world. Um, so it's light, it's fresh, it's beautiful. Um, you can now see my pan. So that's fantastic, isn't it? I'm, I'm ah, back in the game. Back so in the game. Just having a little, little cook along in the pan here. So the Koshu, what I think is really, really cool about this, and we, we talk about it, um, it's turning it up. It's turning, turning up the heat. <laughs> back seat, it. back seat cooking. Back seat chef. Um, but yeah, so um, what's great about this is it sits at 11.5% alcohol, and you're starting to see in the world more and more and more wines higher in alcohol. Well, what, what's yours? This 12, is 14. 12, 14. It's 14. A, a 14% 14 on sale, which percent. is pretty extraordinary. Which is, Wait, can you just um, clarify, the Sancerre, is that wine number one? Wine, wine, number, no, number, wine number one is the Koshu, the Grace yeah. Koshu. Wine number two is the Sancerre. It's just Quite because right. we've got the uh, we we've have got, an interview. We've, we've got an interview with with Grace, and we just wanted to get some wanted to get wine and, and food going, and so yeah. we uh, swapped it around a little bit. So the well, that's nice. That you can, I don't know if it's coming across, but you can start to see there's actually the the pancakes are starting to rise. Have we got our spatula as well? I do, we don't do. You, don't you worry. I've, I've got like, my I've got my times. Um, but mise yeah, en place, it, chef, mise en place. So you, we don't tend to, like you said, we don't tend to associate uh, Japan so much with wine. I spent, I spent a whole month in Japan, um, traveling all around the country, and I, I had various sort of uh, rice wines that they had, uh, obviously the sakes, and um, it, nothing, I never even came across these. It was only when I met up with Jamie back in England that he introduced me to this thing, and I, I do think it is a, a really delicious um, a delicious wine. Um, it's super fresh. It's, it's. I'm going to have a taste of it again. But remind myself, it's not. Uh, it's not a million miles dissimilar from the sunset in some ways. It's a. It's perhaps a bit more. I think it's a little bit lighter, a little bit more floral. It doesn't quite yeah. have the power that the sunset has, and that's why I like this elegance with a, with, a, with a seafood dish. What you'll what you'll see about the Japanese, they really care about their fruit. It's uh, it's a country where you can buy um, fruits which are grapes which are created to absolute perfection it's um it's quite astonishing you look at these grapes and they are they're sort of hundreds of pounds for a packet of grapes and they're given as gifts perfectly spherical perfect sort of texture and they do this for all the the different sort of fruits that they have did you see the flip did i i'd missed the flip I, i'm gutted Shocking. gutted to say, to say that but, so have we, yeah. have we have we popped the poly v up for people to put their tasting notes in on wine one yeah wine one the so grapes little... yeah Oh, <laughs> okay, so we've got, yeah, so but I think people we've got a bit of confusion between the, the two things, so that's perhaps a little unfair. But do, do pop, pop your notes in for the, the grace, the koshi, because when you compare the two, it is, you're right, it's a little bit more floral. There's a little bit more on the nose, actually, but a bit less in the mouth, I think. Interesting. I'll tell you, it's like, it's watching it's water boil, people. isn't it? It's... How's everyone else getting on with uh, making their pancakes? Well, I have asked a question, but it's all a little quiet. It's a little quiet. Well, everyone's watching Eurovision, so that's well, what's going on. Everyone's cooking their pancakes. <laughs> or cooking. Well, that's a very yes, good point. Yeah, yes, chef, that's yeah. what's very, very important. Um, so this, this uh, that's looking better. Lovely There's a bit of colour on that. Are, that's nice. That. Wow, fantastic. That's what we like. That's what we want. Um, but yeah, uh, we should talk a, a little about smoked salmon because there isn't just one kind of smoked salmon and it's, it's, it's very easy to just think, you know, let's just get whatever it is. But when you start actually tasting some of the differences, I, I hope that some of you have, have uh, followed up on that little recommendation because uh, when you find these traditional, often Jewish families in, in eastern London who have been operating for quite a few generations now and they... They, they are just utter masters at creating something which is a, a more subtle sort of flavour. And particularly, um, just like you find with sushi, which I think is why, actually, um, do you know what he did? He picked a wine for this and then changed it. <laughs> so he was going to go for a vermouth. I was. He was, which is a, a cool thing. But and when he said Grace Koshi, I'm like, oh, damn it. That's a really good, good idea. Because, um, yeah, when you think of your sushi, which obviously is a pretty good pairing to have with, with Japanese wine. Um, you get these different grades of salmon, and uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 
generally speaking, on the, the you think it's similar with beef as well, isn't it? It's about the level of the marbling of the fat that goes through it. And they're a little bit less sort of worried about the word fat as we are. You know, we, we hear that and we've been drilled into thinking we must avoid fat. But actually, when it comes to some kind of things like uh, your, 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 your tuna it, uh, and salmon, it's, it's really, really good for flavour. So, let's stop that beeping. Um, so, yeah, it, it, in it, it creates a more subtle sort of melt-in-the-mouth feeling um, that's, that's really good. But what we've got now is we've got some pancakes and some pancakes. Jamie is going to move the cooker off the table, which is a nice thing that you probably don't need to do. But uh, uh, if, we go back, if we go back to our fun camera, I'm going to yeah. attempt to plate this up like I'm a... I'm going to plate up. Fun fact, Jamie something. was actually a young chef of the year once. So I'm not quite but, sure why I, end, I yeah. ended up doing the cooking. When I was young and or a chef. <laughs> For Jamie one used to work uh, in kitchens for years and years before, which is where he first started meeting sommeliers and then started being taken under the wing and realised that actually you know, he'd got a bit of a, you a get, talent for you this. Get, you get to drink, drink more wine. This is a, a very fair point. It doesn't matter if your pancakes aren't perfect shapes. This is all about flavours. Flavours is what it's all about. And um, the, just the, the creaminess of that creme fraiche uh, works beautifully with salmon, but it needs a bit of acidity to cut through it, doesn't oh. it? What, what, what kind of acidity of would you like? Well, we have a little bit here of some nice lemon zest. Even better, you could put some of it on the salmon, mate. Oh, good. It's just a spare bit on the side it's for garnish. garnish. It's the garnish. It's garnish, exactly. The garnish. Um, and, and chives have also got this, this slight... It's almost a kind of a very gently astringent kind of quality that comes through to it, would you not say? Now, he's going for the scissor approach. I saw this on... Um, I saw this on the children's cooking show that my uh, my, my, my my daughter watches. Have you have you have you seen have you seen the thing going around? People saying they've got to cut their alcohol. And yeah, just pouring cut their alcohol. Yep. That's, that's well, we're, thing, we're the people so. who do that. But um, well, that. but it's it's quite funny because um, uh, Jamie looked at my cooking video with horror, going, "That's not how you cut use a knife. You've well, got to use I, a knife I'm like this." Is that there we go. Except in manual focus, so it probably won't like that very much. But it doesn't matter. But there we are. So this yeah. is. Smoked salmon on dill and charred pancakes with a little creme fraiche, lemon and chive. So with that being said, we should probably dive into our video, taste through the wines, learn yeah. a little bit more about koshu, and uh, enjoy your first course. We'll be right back. Enjoy. Sophia is, we only use the grips uh, about 400 meter altitude. Okay. So from the mountainous area. The grace mine, uh, uh, Grace Vine was founded in 1923 by my great grandfather. Uh, it's a family owned company. Um, the current owner is my father, and he's the first generation of the wine family. And I, my brother and I, um, we are the fifth generation. And I'm the winemaker. Uh, yeah, I'm the first female winemaker in the family, so I'm so excited. Um, yeah, so our signature grape variety is kosher. So kosher is very important grape variety to us because uh, in terms of its history and also it's kind of like family love. So it's very, very important. Where are we located? We are uh, Yamanashi. We are located in Yamanashi. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Japanese map, but um, there are two GI geographical indications in Japan. One is Yamanashi, and the another one is Hokkaido, so only two GI. Yamanashi is, of course, the, um, the first place of Japan's wine industry, and uh, the production is the number one wine production, wine, produ wine producing region, so um, it's very important wine region in Japan. Absolutely. And, you know, I, th I think talking a little bit about Koshu, because Koshu is, is indigenous and it took a little while because Koshu was being grown and Koshu was being made into wine, but it, it wasn't at the beginning, it wasn't really recognised as a grape making varietal, was it? That people, oh, sorry, a wine making varietal. Everyone else was like, oh, it's Cabernet, this, that. And Koshu kind of got left behind for a little while until it was, you know, people go, oh, yes, this is vinifera this is vinifera and this is yep. fine and this is for wine making and it took it was a, a little bit behind the times with people going oh for it to get that kind of tick in the box next to its name to go oh yes we can see this is a serious wine grape um and so how did that kind of you know 
help the development? Did you think, oh, well, if Koshu's not got this, we should grow something else? Or has Koshu always been the grape that's been, been grown there? Yeah, Koshu has been grown here about more than 1,000 years. So quite a long time ago. Of course, Koshu uh, originally came from the Caucasus region because it's with the Spinifera. So um, Koshu I came to Japan through China. Uh, 1, 000, more than 1,000 years ago and has been cultivated over 1,000 years. So it has a very long history. And my ancestor, my family, my grandfather, my father has been always um, so much into kosher, you know, it dedicated themselves to make quality kosher wines. So I think, um, of course, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Merlot are very attractive varieties, but kosher is, you know, it's more Japan's identity and it's like our grape variety. So, and the taste very different, you know, it's more pure, elegant style and very go, go well with Japanese food. So I think, uh, you know, kosher is just the very, to me, very Japanese, you know, Japanese taste and Japanese look like and very, very Japanese to me. Without a doubt. And I think that's what, what's great about wine. And, you know, there might be a lot of people, oh, kosher, this is a, this is a new grape for me. Yeah. And that's great. People are trying new things. But, you know, we, we've done a lot of different places, a lot of different regions in the last year. And it's amazing to go, you know, people, oh, this is a new grape. I've never heard of it. Well, that yeah. doesn't mean it's a it's a new grape. It's just new to you, yeah. you know. And you say Koshi's been around for thousands of years. We've done, you know, we did a Georgian Arcatzatelli a couple of months ago that they've been growing <laughs> for eight thousand years. People, oh, yeah. I've yeah. never heard of it. Yeah. And, and this is the joy of being able to tour the world and taste different wines and get different things things open. Um, and you know, for me, Koshi is a very it's a grape that's all by itself. It's difficult mm. to go. Oh, if you like something, you'll like koshu. You know, it, it's light, it's aromatic, but it's got mm -hmm. more substance than it. You can't compare it to Pinot Grigio. It doesn't yeah. have that grassiness that you get from Sauvignon Blanc. So you can't really go, oh, it's kind of a bit like this. You've got mm -hmm. to get it open and, and, and get it into the glass. Um, but you, you, make, you make different tiers of koshu, don't you? You've got different, yeah. different levels and different styles. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the one we're doing in the tasting is the... Du, du, du. Oh, okay. 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 this is my other thing i've got to learn to pronounce how many different things i go around here so, <laughs> that, so that that's the one that we're going to be tasting but you you also do the private reserve wines as well don't you yeah yeah the older wines yeah so so um with with the one that we're tasting what, what's the history to, with that what's what's the reasoning behind the name and um i'm going to pop a little bit in the glass and taste it while we talk yep so Kayagatake is actually the name of the mountain because uh, this vineyard is located on the foot of Mount Kayagatake. Uh, this mountain is volcano, so uh, volcanic soil, and 400 meters to 700 meters, so quite high altitude. Um, yeah, very, uh, I think the most linear wines that I make, the most linear culture that I make. It's lovely, it's bright, it's fresh. As you said, yeah. it's got great acidity. It's yeah. got a slight tropically citrus, almost like a yuzui kind of characteristic in there. Yeah. It's really, it's really delicious. Um, yeah. And as you said, with you know, with with the the you know food and wine pairing with you know seafood and things like that, I think mm. it would be absolutely great. So the wine making is quite simple. You know, it's our all thing, all wines hand picked, and whole bunch pressed, and then fermented in the stainless steel tank. So it's quite simple wine making. But to me, the vineyard is very, very important. Um, very good vineyards in the mountainous side. It's just good wine. I, it's like, I've, I've tasted it previously, but you go back and go, it's, it's unique, it's interesting, it's different. And what's also nice about it, the, the fact that it sits at 11.5% alcohol, um, yeah. is, that, <laughs> is, is that done on purpose to keep it slightly lower? Or is it, you know, just you've got this bright, ripe, you know, this, this high acid acid fruit that allows you to do it what how how, how are we getting 11 and a half percent because you know anything coming out of you know california yeah. or anything coming out, <laughs> you, even out of europe now you're starting to yeah. see sauvignon mm. blancs at 13 13 and a half percent and it's really kind of refreshing to see something at 11 and a half percent that still has body still has weight to it it's not it's not watery and light um yep. so is, is that a winemaking decision to try and go for 11 and a half percent or is that just kind of how it goes 
Yeah, uh, kosher is actually uh, very difficult to accumulate the sugar. So potentially a very low uh, alcohol. So I, I'm, don't, I'm not a big fan of a um, lot of chapterization and acidification. So I try to be more natural than uh, as possible. So um, normally my kosher is like 11 to 12%. So it's, uh, yeah, so it depends on the vintage, but normally 11 to 12%. So quite low in alcohol, I think. And just with, with, the, with the Japanese wine market, do people drink a lot of koshu and stuff that's made in Japan or is there a, a big market for kind of like international varietals or is it a bit of a blend? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, so we export to uh, 30%, about 30% of our production goes to um, uh, foreign countries, so to the export and 70% uh, in domestic markets. Um, but Japanese market is now changing because uh, sake consumption is decreasing and wine consumption is increasing. And yeah, and 10 years ago, uh, when I went to the um, very famous uh, Japanese restaurant, traditional Japanese restaurant, always uh, they served uh, red wine like Bodo, Grand Cru, Prasse. But it doesn't match Japanese food because Japanese food is more, uh, how to say, uh, uh, elegant and more lighter style. So normally uh, it doesn't match Jap uh, like Bordeaux, big style uh, red wine doesn't match well. But um, I wanted to say uh, Japanese wine, uh, no, no, a wine used to be like the brand. So people drink the wine as a brand. So. Um, but now it's changing. Younger people and uh, um, also female consumers um, tend to drink more rosé, uh, white wine in lighter style. And Japanese wine market is more competitive now. So we used to drink more French and Italian wines, but now we uh, consume Chile wines, Argentinian wines, Australian wines. So it's more diverse. So obviously, you know, fifth, fifth generation winemaker there. Um, and from looking, you, you've done you've done a bit of a bit of winemaking around the world, haven't you? You've done done some vintages yeah. in other places. Um, yeah. Where have you been? What was exciting? And from that, you know, what what have you been able to take from the rest of the world to bring back to your winemaking, while still being able to keep a, a traditional Koshu style of wine? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I studied in France for three years. And then I have, I had an opportunity to be an exchange student to Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So I studied uh, both a uh, very top old wine country and new world wine country. And then I decided to go to, uh, to do the vintages in Southern Hemisphere. When I came back to Japan, oh, I, I wanted to do um, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Argentina, and South Africa. So I made a wine in my father's winery. And then after, the, uh, after my vintage in Japan, I went to Southern Hemisphere. And my first year, I went to, I went to New Zealand, Waipara. Um, and, uh, and then the, my second vintage in Southern Hemisphere was Australia. I went to Hunter Valley and the Western Australia, Maga River. Okay. Then I, um, I went back to Japan again and I went to Chile for three months. And then I went back to Japan and I went to Argentina for three months. And then I went to South Africa <laughs> and then Japan and Tasmania, uh, Australia. And that was my last vintage in Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, I learned a lot. Every country is so different and yeah, very different, so. You, you mentioned, and I, I think this is an interesting point that I keep, I keep bringing up in tastings, that you, you studied in France and you said that was old world and then you went to South Africa and you're talking about new yeah. world. There's so many new countries coming like into a more global scale now, you know, the, the, the UK is, you know, we're starting to make some pretty decent wines in England. Um, but these new, these newer countries getting on the global scale, where do you class Japan? Is Japan an old world? Cause you've got this kind of continental 
climate and it's a little bit cooler mm. or is it mm. new world because it's you know got more new world techniques climatically i think more old world side because uh, we have uh, huge vintage variations so it's a uh, you know, japan is a small island so we have like uh, when i did a vintage in chile i was shocked because um, i asked my boss uh, when was the best vintage in chile and he answered me like appears like 2004, 2006, and 2008. And I was uh, shocked because I was surprised because, oh, Chile, uh, they have like um, good vintage, great vintage for one year per two year. How do you say? Once at Yeah, once every other year. year. Yeah. yeah, every other year. So in Japan, it's impossible. Like uh, probably the best vintage I had was 2009. But before that, probably 2002 and before that probably in 1997 so quite a uh, huge vintage variation so i think more climatically more old world style uh, old white or old world um side but uh, mentally uh, we should be like a new world so we must be a uh, challenger you know we must uh, innovate and challenging and I quite like the uh, mentality of South America and Chile Argentina because they are like a, you know challenger. We're talking about Koshu and the Koshu is have you got is there any other you know indigenous grapes that are on the kind of the up and up that we're going to start see, seeing in the UK or is Koshu kind of the grape for Japan? Oh, you mean uh, other indigenous grape variety in Japan or Japanese mm -hmm. indigenous grape variety? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think Koshu is our star <laughs> because we yeah. have we actually have the other indigenous grape varieties, but they are hybrid grape varieties. Okay. So it's totally different from Koshu. Thank, thank you. you very much yeah. for your time, and we'll speak very so, soon. thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank enjoy. You. Thank you. Bye. Hello and welcome back. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, you know, Japan's a cool country. Um, uh, but these are two really, really great wines. And I, I, I have to say, uh, I'm irritated because I thought I would smash the vermouth out of the park. And that one, it, it, it seems to be about 50-50 from what I can see. But of course, this is your opportunity. If you've got your poly V and you've finished your food, um, why not tell us what you think? So we've got a little set of questions. We decided to break it apart into those who had the food and those who didn't have the food because obviously one of the big things is that the food changes your perception of the wine and that's why we're, we're here having it. But we have these little white pots on the table and these are basically Jamie's little props for teaching when he does teaching his WSET classes. Um, you can break these components down and actually see it. And I remember I, 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 when I did my first WCT course, I sat there going, yeah. that's really weird. And someone handed me, it was a Barolo. And a, uh, he's, I don't care about your WCT courses. You did it with someone I else. I did it with someone else. Cheated it's, on me. It's true. I cheated on him with a, with a, uh, with a master of wine. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> wow. So, um, but when, when I was given this Barolo, I, I've never really liked Barolos. I just didn't get them. It was just like, uh, you know, when, unless you're having something in one that's really, really old and I've never been able to afford that up, up until that point. So uh, someone gave me a, this Barolo, a young Barolo, um, couldn't stand it at first. It was just too tannic, too, uh, too weird. And then I had it with some salt and some lemon juice. And suddenly it broke the tannins down. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I really like this. And the other flavour started to come through. So what hopefully Jamie can now explain to you is what these little pots are. And hopefully you, you might have seen these. What foods you'll find them in, and what they do to the wine. So these little pots. That these little pots. They're ceramic. They are ceramic. Oh, was that not the answer you were looking for? Oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so what's in them? Oh what's in them? Lots God. of stuff. So food and wine pairing. What's in the pot? <laughs> I kind of started, and then we got the video sorted, so I'm back in. Food and wine. When we just talk about, you know, we have these kind of blanket statements of, you know, red wine goes with meat, white wine goes with fish, all that kind of stuff. But not all foods are created equal, and not all wines are created equal. And there's no real right or wrong. There's, there's some things that you shouldn't do with food and wine pairing, but generally, it's about what you like, Chardonnay what with you frazzles. enjoy. Oh, sorry, Monster Munch. Monster Munch with white burgundy. <laughs> Apparently, that is king, what they what they call a king of the pairings. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's you know, once you've done that, you can't go back. This is why you know, it's your, it's Caroline your... can't come over here and talk about pairings. She's reached the pinnacle 
of all pairings. Yeah. And can, ne- can never have food and wine together ever again. So I, I love her. You, you, know, you never see her eating anything. She's just got the glass of wine because she can't pair anymore. It's not good for her. So um, and then we had that winemaker who came on and we tasted a rosé with him, which he said, "What you should be drink uh, eating with this is frazzles." And that's where my mind went. And and we tried it and it was really good. So maybe there's method in the madness there. But what we've got to think about is how these foods and wines interact, and not. You know, foods have lots of different bits and pieces in there. You know, it's mm. not often we're just eating a place, piece of plain chicken that goes, yeah. that's a plain chicken. And, well, we, and they change with cooking as well. Which ab- is absolutely. So, you know, let, let's, you know, look at look at the dish that we had. Yeah. yeah. So we've got, you know, the things that we talk about in, in a dish. We go, oh, has this dish, has it got any fattiness in it? Of course we do. We've got some salmon in there. Um, has it got acidity in it? And we get that from, you know, the lemon fattiness, you know, from the, from the creme fraiche as well. Um, do we have any salty elements in there? Mm-hmm. Yes, we do. Well, they swim in the sea. <laughs> this is why he's on. This is why he makes the... Uh, uh, you know, so you don't get a Cambridge degree for nothing. I'm going to start having you write the scripts. Um, <laughs> God, where did I get to? This is... Salt. This, salt. This is you adventures. This Move is on. serious. Umami. Salt so, sauce. So umami, umami is kind of what's classed as the fifth flavour. So you have, you know, salt, sweet... Sour, bitter, umami. Um, and umami is that feeling of, like, that meatiness of feeling, the, that weight on the palate that you either get from, from steak or from mushrooms or things like that, and soy sauce. And MSG is the thing that really gives that, that you find a lot yeah. of kind of um, takeaway foods and things get, like that. Gets a bad some, rap, but, uh, it it's a, a, bad it's a, rap, but it's a top it's a, chef's it's a, top tip, isn't it? It's a flavour enhancer. Yeah, it, um, it literally, in, and it's been proven it doesn't give you headaches. If it is giving you headaches, it might be the bottle of, uh, of cheap wine that you drank with it, but that's, that's, that's just me in that case. But, but yeah, it's, it really did get a bad rap, but it, it's a lot, you'll find a lot of chefs will actually put a little bit, a little bit in there. So what we can consider is each of these things will, if this is in the food, it will do something to the wine. Mm. So if we just go from, so I'll go down my list of things. So I've, I've got lemon here for our acidity, and I'm going to give this to Mr. Taylor because he's going to taste some... Um, Lemon yeah. with his uh, wine of choice. No sour lemon. So, oh, no. Oh, no. so lemon is high acid. So you would potentially, when you've got a wine that's got good acid as well, high acid, it will balance that out and it will keep the acid balanced and bring the fruit flavors out more. So I think that's where we saw hmm. the, um, the the lemon and the acidity is what would have really helped the Sancerre get a little bit better. Yeah. So if you want to have a little sip of the Koshu and then taste the lemon that's and then taste one. it again. That is that one. If anyone's got any bits and pieces or leftover lemon from this, um, then just have a, a little... That's the sunset. Little... Is... <sighs> yep, I've got the wrong wine. It's really, it's ruined the experiment. It's all over now. So you've got the koshu there. Yep. You have a little, 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 little nibble of the lemon. And then go back again. Straight away, while the lemon's still on your palate. What you'll find there, because there's not mega, mega acid in that, you'll get a little bit wow. more fruit, but not yeah. as much. But it keeps the acidity zippy. Go for that. But do exactly. It's actually almost going into sort of orange peel yeah. at that point. So That's you get really more of the citrus flavours, you get more of the fruit flavour. But yeah. do the same again with the, the Sonset, because the Sonset, we talked about more citrus, more tropical, those kind of things. And you'll get these, the, the, the acidity stays high and these flavours will race it, really kind of build it. Yeah? Yeah, that's just sort of a bit more punchy. And it's, Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, really so cool. So, what do we go on to next? Salt. So, salt brings out flavours. So, salt will enhance all the flavours within a wine. So, if there's a you know, so if you've got kind of like, this is an okay wine, but there's some bits about it that you don't like, the salt will enhance those things. It's the same, this is why we season food, to bring the flavours out. Um, but also, if you've got a wine that's low in acid, it will kind of dull everything. It becomes a bit nair, a bit flabby. You don't want to have kind of too much salinity with kind of like a big, heavy oak Chardonnay, for example. Okay. Uh, what do we got next down the line? Well, there's your soy sauce. Umami. Umami. Flavour enhancer. So I think yeah. that's relatively self-explanatory. So I don't think there's any point in having salt with these two wines, really, is there? Oh, absolutely. We, we, what do absolutely. you think so? Yeah, yeah we, 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 don't, we don't need to do them all. We'll, we'll, we'll wait, okay. we'll leave the umami until we get onto some okay. red. But right. I, I do, once again, with your with your Sancerre. Mm-hmm. So now go to the Sancerre and see how much more those flavors, even more than from the lemon, how much more those flavours come out. 
And salt we, wow. can dry, salt we can dry again when we get into the reds as well, because salt will soften the tannins in a red. So you should get this really kind of like the opulent tropical fruits will really coming out of that. Yeah, now. it's, it's yeah. almost sort of into lilt. The totally tropical totally taste. Tropical like taste. I said, yeah. look at that. What's, that. what's next down the as list? Much I hate to agree with them. We've got sugar down the list next. We're not going to do sugar on this. We'll talk a bit about sugar yeah, when we get to dessert, we dessert wines. And then we've got spice. And we'll talk a little bit about spice going a little bit further yeah, forward. Yeah, probably more um, with this next but, one. So, but what I think, you know, looking through the, the tasting notes and what people were saying in the chat, it was amazing how things changed, that people had one opinion and then they had the food and it turned to something else and there's a different opinion that, oh, I preferred that, but with the food that really shone out and went from there. So have we got any thoughts on the Poly V as to what the favourites were? I think we need to go went? to the next slide on that, but there's a couple of people who haven't quite finished it. So uh, I might let, I don't know. Let's flick on. Let's go to the next slide. Hit the right button on that pet slide there. Hit right arrow. There you go. Oh. Oh, yes. So now we're on to how did wine one pair with the smoked salmon? So this is the Grace Koshu Jamie's wine. How did you like it? And you can just click on the happy face. We haven't tried this one before. Yes, so you can just click on the happy face. That's the only face you can click on. Not but there the are degrees face. of happiness. So, you know. <laughs> just more, more happy than the one you're going to click next. That's all I ask for. So we'll give a couple of minutes for this. Any, any... So I'm going to dip my finger in the soy sauce and try that experiment again. What? Well, why don't you just dip it on the bit you're throwing all over Shush. the table? So, so umami is also a kind of flavour enhancer, but in a rather different way to salt, isn't it? And yeah, it's also um, its own flavour on its own. It is. It's, it's umami is more about texture and mm. weight than than flavour itself. The you know, and it's tough with a white wine in umami because you don't really have lots of kind of like structure mm. in those kind of, you know, when you get into those tertiary flavors in a red wine, umami will kind of enhance those. When we talk about the leather, the tobacco, the mushrooms, those earthy kind of things, a bit of umami will make that much more, much more prominent. We don't really it, talk about umami uh, with seafood and fish and stuff like that. Although, I mean, when you think about it, you, you, you quite often will have like, a, your, let's go back to Japan and your sushi, Obviously, you'll have a bit of soy sauce with your fish there, so that it's it's very sort of country dependent. But but rather weirdly, uh, uh, when I just tried that there, um, I just put a little bit on, and I had the koshu, and I felt like I was eating uh, a piece of sashimi. <laughs> it's a really weird sensation because so, it's a while since I had. So the fun salmon. fact. If you don't want to afford to go out to a fancy smancy sushi restaurant, just lick just soy sauce, lick soy sauce with koshu. your koshu. Feel like you're Every in Japan. Time. Alex Taylor's dot tips. That's, thank anyway, you for that. What, 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 are the, what are the thoughts on wine number one? And then we can flick to wine number two. Who, who likes it? Who we... doesn't? Is so it a good it's pairing? it's all on um, the two green faces. That's, oh, that's good. That's good news. Happy times. Well, mostly. One in oh, the middle. It might tell me. I might have to go in on my phone and see what uh, the actual one figures the orange, are. One on the yellow. Okay. And then... Mostly, Mostly on the two, two greens. greens. Ooh, interesting. Okay, fantastic. Very fantastic. interesting. Well, it's good that people like them. That's that's a good start. Should we go to the Let's next go to one? the next wine, and then we can because we need to be sort of moving on to the main course. Um, oh, actually, there we are. Yeah. Wine two. Um, we we are probably hopefully people have had a nice chance to eat their pancakes, and we're just getting ready for the last phase of cooking uh, the casserole. Um, now we we had a thought about uh, what to cook and. Um, we started thinking about the classic food and wine pairings and you very quickly come to things like a coq au vin and especially when you've only got one pot to cook with. But we decided primarily for, oh well, for, for one reason, uh, but also for a secondary reason, we would have to sort of s switch it up a bit and, and change it. And it's probably cultural appropriation these days, but we, we put some things into it to make it a little bit more Spanish inspired and a little bit more spicy so that we could play with could those spicy Could not pair flavors. any Spanish wines with it. Indeed, well, you can as a Tempranillo. You know, but the, we, we the, Probably the number one pairing with this would be Rioja, but we aren't, we aren't doing that because we've tried to be doing But if you were just doing the Coca Van, it would be very simple. He would have gone for one Burgundy and I would have gone for a different Burgundy and we would have learned nothing. Or maybe the same Burgundy. Or prof possibly the same Possibly Burgundy, the same indeed. Burgundy. Um, so so we, we, we shook it up, but also we didn't want to have any problems with hashtags and things. So Yes, um, so we, we've gone with the, the hashtag, show us your van. Indeed, exactly. indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but speaking, speaking of hashtags and pictures and all that kind of stuff, um, if you if you see in your little booklet, we are we're going to give away a case of some of our favourite wines from the last seven months. Yeah, to, so plate up, <coughs> make sure you take some cool Instagram pictures. Instagram and... pictures for online wine tasting club, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. And we're going to uh, we're going to pick our favourite our favourite pictures, and um, the top one's going to 
get a case I, of wine. I can't remember if there's another slide after this, Caroline. Well, I think there is. So let's go to the next one, shall we? Uh, okay. So this no, it's not. So that's fine. That's fine. We are where we are with. So that. where we need to get to is if we've finished our our koshu and our sonsel, we need to get wine number three and wine number four in the glass because yeah, I'm thirsty. Well, and as you can see, we've kind of gone extremes here because I've I've picked a white wine and. Um, Alex has picked a... A very red wine. A very red wine. Yeah. Um, but with this white wine and this red wine, we need to have a little bit of food. So hopefully we're at the stage that it's there. We are at our little point that we just need yeah. to pop our kale in for the last 10 minutes. So we're going to do that right now. But what we don't have is an oven here. Oven. The, so we're winery, just so going to do it right here. But we're just we, going to do it right here on but, the hob. But... but if anyone wants to watch me do it, we can we can go to we can get a camera oh, mode. Well, we hope so. There's dun, a dun, tentative dun. moment, uh, and we'll see if yeah we have a pot. That's exciting. But does so, it move? God, it's not like this on the BBC, is it? Dearie me. Mm -hmm. um, so the kale it will start to sort of wilt down. That's looking good. But before we put the kale in, you might have noticed the top tip was to put the the bay leaves in the middle so that you can just. Pull them out and Stick they don't feet. get lost. Sticks his fingers in my Stick cocker my... van. That's Indeed. Right. Thanks very much. But that's looking pretty yummy. Um, I, I have to say the, the sauce has rendered down and it, it just sort of steams the potatoes in that in that sauce. And I think that's a that's a really cool thing. Jamie doesn't like kale very much, so I I, I picked a really good a recipe for him there. Come on. That's good. Right, let me in the pot. Get our lid back on and if you're at home, you can pop that back in the oven and I would check it after five minutes because it depends on the oven how quickly it steams away. Um, but uh, yeah, it just it's just so, I have to admit, when it comes to uh, co cooking, my wife likes to shout at me and say, you have used every single pot and pan and knife and spatula and whatever it is in the whole of our possession and nothing will fit in the dishwasher. What are we going to do? Well, we've, so, done, we've done the same, we're just only allowed one we, pot. <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah. So we only permit ourselves that one pot. So there are advantages to one pot cooking, which are practical and wonderful. So anyway, what we... Right, so I want you to talk to me you're, first, because... Oh, you do? Because first time for everything. you yeah. have picked a white wine with a dish <laughs> cooked in red wine. So you've got the tannins from the red wine, you've got uh, the colour and the flavour from that red wine, and you've gone for a white wine. How's that going to work? I'm genuinely really intrigued. This is going to be quite fun, because we haven't tried this. White wine goes with chicken, yeah? White wine does go with chicken, but... I thought that wine, was the rules. Does white wine go with red wine? Well, what, all wines go rose. together. Rose. No, not how you make a rosé. Well, I'm not the wine maker, here, am I? So, yeah. my, my, my reasoning behind this, um, and I'm going to talk quickly about this, we're then going to do the wine news, and then oh, we'll yeah. talk about your wine. Um, my feeling of this is we've got lots and lots of rich flavours in there. So we've yeah. got that fattiness from the chicken thighs. We've got that fattiness yeah, from the chorizo. The yep. um, the what 25 grams of butter we chucked in. Absolutely. <laughs> I bought 25 grams. Um, <laughs> so we've got a lot of rich, heavy flavours in there. Yeah. Um, which sometimes, if you then do a rich, heavy red wine with that, that's a lot of rich, a lot of power, a lot of, mm, a lot of mm. over the top, a lot of more of more of more of more on top. What I think with this, we've got... So this is a Vedeca. It's a uh, it's an indigenous grape from southern Italy, down in Puglia on the hill. So it's very yeah. very warm there. So you get this richness and ripeness in the wine. Um, for those of you who have been with us for a while, this is this is uh, Angelo who we've talked to a couple of yeah. times. Yeah. Um, with the uh, we did the Negro Amaro with him. We've done his his Primitivo, and he, he's back on the case here. Um, absolutely beautiful wine. But what this has is it has this beautiful richness, mm -hmm. this great fruitiness, which will go very well with the, yep. the richness and the fattiness in there. But it's then got this beautiful acidity that's just going to kind of cut through at the end. And what you need when you've got a rich dish like this, and especially with a spicy dish as well, with the chorizo, you don't want a high alcohol red wine because that's okay. spice that we, you know, spice exacerbates alcohol. It makes it feel a little bit hotter than it is. So this, that I think, true. you've got that richness of white wine. You're twelve and a half percent alcohol, so it's not mega yeah, high. Yeah, this is a bit higher. And you've got this lovely, fresh acidity that's going to almost act like a squeegee on your tongue. So every time you go back to try this food it sort of again, it's it. like yeah. cleansing the palate. It's like tasting it again for the okay. first time. Are you, are so, you not worried that the flavours might get a bit overloaded? Because I know you're saying that you know you you, you, you don't want to add more and more, but are we not trying to sort of like match sort of levels of flavour a bit, or is this quite a flavourful white? I haven't tried it. Dive in. So have a try. Dive in. This, this, this is, this is almost 
you know, if okay. I want to pick a generic place, hmm. um, it's almost white Ronian style. So it's got this yeah. richness. It sits on the palate. It's it's big. It's a bold white. Bold enough, mm. you, can, you can almost pair it with pickled onion monster munch. It's got that <laughs> level of boldness. You're worried now, aren't you? No, you're a I, little I, I, bit I, I, worried. Uh, look, to be honest, you're the pro, dude. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I think that's a, that's a very cool wine. I, I like that, and and I'm intrigued to know because it is quite sort of fruity. It's not sweet. You get you it, you're, you're, it, we're back into this thing which we've often talked about: the difference between fruity and sweet. Fruit is a set of flavour compounds, chemicals. That, it's got a nice savoury texture, but, doesn't it? That would yeah. go really well with chicken thighs. Yeah, but I, I know. in a in a in a tempranillo based sauce, I'm intrigued. I'm really intrigued. But we should do some wine news because we've only got a few minutes before this is. Cooked. The kale is ready, and so he'll talk very quickly timer, about Moldebosch. And we've got a we've got a Moldebosch interview we do. momentarily. So, we do. Um, wine news. What's going on in the wine news? Well, want to start with the good news or the bad news? The well, let's start let's with do, the let's start with the sad news. Let's do yeah. the sad news to start with. That, that's um, fair. So um, this. Uh, uh, this last week that we've had um, has seen the, the passing of um, Jim Clendellen. Uh, uh, Clendellen, and uh, uh, he's sorry, I, I, it's, it's, I'm not quite sure the, the sequence of the letters, but he's one of the absolute utter characters and heroes of the American winemaking scene, which is very dear to both Jamie and, and myself. And he's from Santa Barbara County, which is down sort of just to the, you know, well, it's near Santa Barbara, strangely, but for those who don't know, it's just northwest of, uh, of Los Angeles. And it's, it's, his wines were utterly, utterly brilliant. And they, they really it's, it, it's a phenomenal story. So he, he was at Zacamesa previously to, mm -hmm. to so it's a winery called <coughs> Obon Climat. Um, Obon Climat, which, ABC. Which, uh, not anything but Chardonnay. No, indeed. In fact, he's famous for his Chardonnay, Chardonnay. which so, is brilliant. started in 1982, him and his partner, and they did everything. Yeah. They picked every grape, they harvested everything, they crushed everything, they made every bottle of wine, because their whole thing was, they had no money for labour, no, they had to no. do it, and it, it was really, um, you know, in at the deep end, you know, you look at a lot of people like open the wineries now, it's like, oh, we need a winemaker, and a this, and a that, and that, that, they did everything. And just some of the best Chardonnays, and also some of the best Pinot Noirs, they're, they're yeah. one, of, one of the, the outstanding bottles I've had in recent times was their 2014 Isabel Pinot Noir, which yeah. was beyond yeah. magic. And, yeah. they're, they're insane. You, you, I, and I don't want to advertise our competitors, but actually the Wine Society have them, and uh, you should check one out if you're a member, because they're really good. We should get them then. We should, we should get them. We should get them in. We'll get them. Um, we'll get and, them. And, and I think he also, I, I, I have a strange feeling that he was uh, interviewed by um, Oz Clark and James May on the, mm -hmm. their road trip around California as well. But a real character, he thrived on the personal interaction. He was just fun and great. Great and, wine, and, drinking yeah. good wine with good people. Yeah. And that, that and was his he thing. He struggled. So with the, the lockdown but, but um, yeah very sad and uh, may rest in peace um, so on a more light note uh, we've got a story from England which is of course where we're going next month if you haven't got a ticket please do because it's going to be absolutely brilliant we've already tasted through some of the wines and we've got our interviews and uh, booked in person we're, we're going, going to the wineries we're yes, going filming finally. next week we might do some instagram live down there so keep we an eye might, out we might we might yeah cat caroline's looking in fear they're going to be let loose with a camera <laughs> live by themselves with no off button but there is the story of um england has uh, an increasing number of vineyards there are about a million and a half vines planted in the last 12 months alone and that's that's a significant number it's probably not if you're a, a country which has half of your country planted out but we don't you know vineyards are, are increasing in number but they're few and far between but in a strangely wonderfully english quirk an awful lot of them it turns out are from hobbyists from people who've just decided that they were going to go and buy an acre of land and plant some grapes on it and it's going to be a great hobby to do get out there and just look after these vines and on, a, on an acre of land that's probably a thousand plants you're going to have to look after it's quite intimidating stuff but the number of those has increased 25 percent in the last year alone and this is a crazy statistic there are now 75 percent more hobby vineyards than there are actual commercial vineyards in this country. And this one up here, I'm gonna to have to check their names quite carefully. I didn't print them. But it's a Lord and Lady of Carlton House in, uh, in Yorkshire who've planted uh, an acre and a half or so on their land. And Lord and Lady Fitzalan Howard of Carlton Towers. Thank you, Caroline. That's wonderful. But yes, a typical everyday couple planting in their everyday back garden of their everyday house right there, um, perhaps. 
Yes. Anyway, we've so got, that's we've that's got quite fun. Than that. We we yeah, I've got two in my garden at we, the moment. We've got one. We have one. We do. Vin Diesel, his name Vin is. Vin Diesel, yeah. the Durif. <laughs> so, that's uh, quite enough wine news. Uh, we're not going to do a Jamie's question tonight. We'll get back to that uh, at some point soon. But we couldn't really think of anything mm. about food and wine. So, I could, but I was excited to cook. Very excited anyway. To cook. I'm going to play it up. Let's go and see what this looks like. You can talk about Moldaboss yeah. while I play it up. We can show okay. everyone what I've attempted to make. And then All right. we can go to a video. Um, actually, I'm not going to talk too much about Moldaboss because um, it's in Stellenbosch. Um, it is uh, just to the west side. It's near some of the real top, top vineyards in Stellenbosch. And it is a family run thing uh, that was then taken over by someone that got then taken over by someone else. But they are one of the real innovators of the South African wine scene. And they were the first people to put, um, uh, to put uh, 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 what's it called, Chenin Blanc into oak. And they called it Steen op Oot. And uh, this, they've, they've just kept on innovating. And they were one of the first people to like really experiment with Cabernet Franc. And Cabernet Franc, uh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a variety a variety of grapes, I nearly said varietal, wrong thing, um, that is used in Bordeaux, um, and it forms a sort of backbone of those Bordeaux blends. But it's, it's not so often used on its own, other than in places like Argentina and Chile, which are really starting to explore this grape a bit more. So it's a fun grape, and it's quite a cool grape, but this is a big wine, and I felt that this is the sort of wine that would work with a big flavour of this, with a bit of the spice. They always talk about like hot food and spice coming together. It's a 14.5%, it's, it's absolutely delicious, and um, it's a really special wine, this. Uh, they only make about 3,000 bottles of it. So what we did was we decided we would go and talk to Henry, and Henry, oh look, here it comes, here it comes. Um, so yeah, uh, do feel free to place up yourself and then have a little look at our Oh, that looks beautiful, Jamie. Very nice indeed. Very nice. Very nice. Excellent. Um, Don't want to tilt that Lots too much. of kale just for you. Um, and um, yes, we went to go and talk to Henry, who's the new winemaker at Mulderbosch. He also makes wine on his own label, and he's been in Stellenbosch pretty much since he was 12. So, so we went enjoy, to go and talk to him. Enjoy this. Enjoy this. Enjoy food. some food. Eat, White wine, in. red wine. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see you back later. Well, you know, grew up in the Eastern Cape, actually, until I was okay. about 12 years old. But uh, 12 years old, that's high school for us. Uh, moved over to Stellenbosch with family and in the middle of everything, you know, in the middle of the vineyards. Sort of the whole, the whole wine landscape was part of, our, part of my upbringing. After matric, after my final year, I was enrolled in electric and electrical engineering degree oh, right. at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, it was a Wednesday and over lunchtime, um, the the oenology department had all these wine tastings in the department's <laughs> um, faculty. And every lunchtime on a Wednesday, I was there tasting, smith, spitting, swirling. It was, it was so much fun. And I was set in line just to switch over to oenology, viticulture, the next for my third and fourth specific, uh, specializing years. So I just decided, go for it. This is, this is what, uh, what I've been training for all my life anyway. So let's, yeah. let's do it. So okay. it's a big combination of all the loves of the subjects that I really liked, microbiology, um, organic chemistry, um, a little bit of physics, a little bit of mass, but then oenology and viticulture, which is, which is a combination of all of those. Um, so it's just a fantastic fit. It is, and, it, and I think the thing that really got me is just how much then you, you've got that scientific side of it, but then ultimately you're, you're making decisions based on not just the, you know, what is this particular profile of this, but but what does it taste like? And then it becomes a, that, that blend of art and science. Completely. Sometimes you, you think, you think about a thing so theoretically sometimes, um, and you plan it out to a T, but coming to the execution, it just doesn't work because the feel isn't there. The, it's, it's just, it's, it's about your plan in your head, but then what comes in and the grapes and which way they want to go. So with a lot of trial and error, um, you can, I come to the conclusion that uh, with all the theory that I've got in my mind, um, it's, it's actually helpful just to be able to steer the wine into the direction that it wants to go. I mean, you, you can, that's why I really don't like the term winemaker because the wine, the wine dictates. It's, it's not the maker. Um, the wine dictates or the grapes dictate in which style it's best to go in or, or how it's you know, making the best wine out of a certain patch of grapes the theory or let's say the, the knowledge that you have is to just try and 
shepherd the whole process with the least amount of interruptions and um, upsets uh, yeah. to get to the to the best of wine at the end of the day. You spend Literally, a bit of time we, out in the vineyards trying to sort of guide like you know what they're doing, viticultural practice and that. Absolutely, yeah. We um we're about forty six hectares on the farm if we just look at at Mulderbush per se. And we've got we've got all everything that we work with, um, but we also have to work with with outside growers. So it's basically just long term strategic alliances with all of these growers, um, just to make sure that we're all we're all on the same page. It's uh, it, these these guys have been also done it for for years and years. So it's not like I'm out there and and telling them what to do because they know their farms, they know the soils. Um, I, I try and stylistically guide them into what I want to be able to do with the grapes and um, they'll then try and grow it. Saying that, you know, our, our viticultural approach, um, it's just to you know, sort of realize that the onus is on us and then obviously also on the growers to, to keep um, that environmental impact to a minimum. That's why we've partnered with these specific um, the growers with this long-term um, strategic alliance. It's just a guys that that are on exactly the same wavelength. They've they they've also got the same heart as we have for for nature, and um, it's great to be able to work with them because it's their farms. It's going to their kids, and their generations are going to pass it on. And um, you can you just know that whatever comes off of those farms that's going to be the right fit. We want to be uh, producing a style of wine that fits the terroir. I know it's a, it's a, it's a big cliche these days, you know, just making, making the style of wine that, that fits that, that plot or that parcel or that piece of soil. But it's, it really is all about trying to fit the grape um, organically into the style that it wants to be. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what, what are the biggest sort of pressures you face in the vineyard? Um, we've got some plots in the Swartland uh, specifically that go to our Cabernet Sauvignon Rosé, which are unirrigated still. And yeah, there's the, in terms of micro, micro stress or, or fungal stress, disease stress, um, how we want to call it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite low. Um, the, the whole of let's say the Polka Dry or Somerset West Stellenbosch region where we are. We call it the Cape Doctor. You might have heard of it before. That's a quite, a, quite a strong southeasterly blowing wind. And that really does take a lot of pressure off diseases. Some years we've got, we've got a lot more rain than, than usual in, um, in ripening season. Then you have, to, you, have to be, you have to have your wits around you if you want to try and uh, keep away from the nasties. But uh, mostly it's, it's quite uh, stress-free. There's all sorts of factors that go into when you pick your harvesting dates. Are, are you sort of um, going more on sort of the flavors of the berry or are you trying to get that balance of the, the, the acidity and the, the sugars right or as a sort of mixture of the both? I think it's always a mixture of the both. I'm, I'm really into, into uh, balancing all sorts of aspects and it, it's, it's definitely a mixture. I'm, I'm a little bit on the net analytical side, like I like you've probably picked up, uh, I love the, the chemistry part of it, but yeah. also you know, there, there is that aspect of artistry or let's say ex, um, experience. I've been going into vineyards for 20, 25, close to 25 years probably now already and just tasting, 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 trying to figure out when is the best time to take off the grapes, when's the best time to harvest and to make the best wine out of it so there's a lot of experience that also comes into it the fruit profile which types of fruit at which types of, of sugar ripeness and um it's it does come into account the next year it's going to be different um so you, <laughs> yeah. you always have to sort of try and um, level yourself to what you taste um so let, let's talk about your winery um you know when you get those grapes in what's the sort of hmm. like, talk wine making oh. to me <laughs> all right Mulderbosch started in 1989. So the winery was built um, quite a lot earlier than that. Went around with the original, the guy that put together the cellar, all the equipment and everything. He came to the cellar today and just like, oh, I built this place in 1971 or 1980 or whatever it was. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty amazing. And he told me, well, this wasn't there and that wasn't there. And these concrete tanks we moved out there and these scales we put up there. So it was quite nice to, to go around with him. Um, and, but the striking thing is most, most of what, what he did is, is still there. I mean, out of a personal point of view, um, 
I used to also make a lot of wine in modern cellars with all the toys and bells and whistles and, you know, you can do what you want. And in a sense, um, that sort of restricts you almost because you've got this beautiful set piece of technology that does everything for you by the press of a button. You can't, you can't fine tune, you can't, you can't really, you know, you're, the, the way that you make it is sort of fixed. But with a with a seller like that, yeah, you've got all these different components of of, of things that you can do. Um, it opens up a lot of different techniques, and I think the, the thinking behind or the the process um, becomes quite more uh, theoretical and practical. And that's why I like working in an, old, an older seller. Um, so the grapes come in, and sometimes it's machine harvested grapes, which is which is quite cool because you, you can do it at three o'clock in the morning and it comes in nice and cool yeah, nice and, and very fresh. And, and then you put it through the system and you finish pressing by, by six, seven o'clock in the morning, which is, which is great. So you can, you can get the reds in and start looking at all sorts of other stuff, but um, it comes in the cellar and uh, in through a, through a big way bin, through a crusher destemmer. And then it's as basic as, as just trying to settle it as, um, mechanical as possible. I don't like playing with too much enzymatic settling actions. So with uh, fermentation, we've got big stainless steel tanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can, we've got some smaller stainless steel tanks. We can do sm- smaller lots and, and small lot fermentations. We've got, um, now recently we've imported and put in place uh, a few foodras, 1,500 liter big, okay, big cool. barrels which are really, really nice to work small lots with. And um, for all our wine, we go to barrel. On the yeast side, when you're doing the fermentation, do you, do you tend to work a bit with something that comes in from the vineyards or do you, do you try to choose the yeast? For the, for the reds, we try and do as, as natural as possible. I mean, it's a quick ferment, it's a hot ferment and everything is there. It's, it's just a question of trying to, to help it through the process as quickly as possible. And as dry as possible, we every year there seems to be a bit of a um, an experiment that didn't go exactly as planned. But <laughs> in, at the end of the day, it it, it does end up uh, end up to be okay. But uh, you know, natural ferment is always a always always a bit of a, a gamble. A challenge, yeah. But, yeah. but some... exactly, but it, it brings a complexity, and that's why we like to play around with quite a bit of natural actually, and in in all the the, um, the styles that we make, all the wines that we make. Um, there's a, a a percentage of natural ferment together with inoculation. Fantastic. I think I might move on to the reds now because uh, this obviously this is the main course for what we're doing. Uh, literally in this, in this mm-hmm. case, and this you've got Indeed. to compete with Puglia's finest white wines. I think the 2016 is looking really really smart at the moment. It's obviously a, a little bit of a riper style. Um, 2016 comes in at 14 and a half alcohol. But it's uh, it's definitely on the right side of ripeness for Cabernet Franc in South Africa. Done really well, Cabernet Franc in South Africa is 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 quite a an edgy uh, grape variety. If not if not done correctly, it can be quite uh, green and herbaceous and uh, um, let's say astringent almost. But done right, some of the best wines you can make. You know, the 16 is amazing. 17 months oak with, um, I think it was... It's a mix of about 50% or new, or... new French oak, yeah, yeah, quite a bit. And then the red well, for, for a certain time, for about 12 months, and then again into a food row for just uh, another six months. And looking really smart. So this is a single vineyard. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Because I'm guessing it, hmm. the, the visculture side is really important for, for Cab Franc and um, particularly Absolutely. controlling those sort of green flavours. Yeah. No, look, we, we, we try to do a lot of work in the Cabernet Franc. The vineyard that it comes from is a vineyard from, from Mulderbosch. It's about, well, now um, it's, it's 12, 13 years old. But mm-hmm. you've got to do... A lot of stuff, right? I mean, you've got you've got so much work being done um, just by putting it in the right sites, getting the right soil combinations, and then your your canopy management and your manipulations. They have got a lot to do with with the grapes and how they ripen and and the different um, precursors that you can you can 
end up with, with just the right of sunlight or too little sunlight or too much sunlight. I think ultimately the vineyard selection is, it's a very small batch. Um, it's one vineyard on the farm. It's, uh, it's probably not even three, 4,000 bottles for the 16. I don't know exactly, but we're looking at, at about 3,000 bottles for the 2019. So I expect sort of the same thing. Um, small scale, very high intensity, and just trying to put the best in the bottle. It's on a VSP 5 wire system. So yeah. we, we, can, we can maintain um, the, the whole shoot position um, vertically the whole time and with, with um, shoot tips, tips and tops, uh, we can try and manipulate, like I said, the sunlight penetration into the bunch zones. It's trying to do the small things right to be able to get to the right conclusion at the end of the day. You're going to end up with something like this in a glass and that's, that's rewarding. <laughs> He's going to try yeah. something now, isn't he? He's going to come in. Thing. You've, got, you've got primary fruits there, really strong, like cassis that's really there hmm. for me. And Absolutely. Some little darker berries. Um, but then you move... But into also those classical graphite notes and um, that sort of a gravelly dust road aspect uh, that's sort of almost typical Cabernet Franc coming through. So, Cabernet yeah, yeah, yeah. has all those great things that people love about Cabernet Sauvignon, but without the greenness and I think this does really well uh, when it gets the ripeness anyway this isn't my interview this is his wine so I'm going to go and drink this in the corner but it's a pleasure Sod off, Jamie. <laughs> enjoy <Yeah>. it <laughs> enjoy the winning wine yeah I, I, that's that's got that full balance the fruit the the you know the the, the character that comes from that some probably some feels like some really high quality oak going into that and all the tans have merged yeah, beautifully sure. I just said that uh, and it's developing these these nice characteristics of age. Like it's only five years old, but you're really starting to get the the leather and the sort of mm. it's, it's it's going into those tobacco leaf kind of characters, I think. But that's what I love about Cabernet Franc. It's it's a or sort of an amalgamation amalgamation of everything that we really love in a in a good Bordeaux. Um, you've got the the seriousness of the Cabernet Sauvignon and also the plushness that the Merlot brings. It's, and the Cabernet Franc is sort of the backbone of that blend always in my mind. What do you think? Um, so obviously the answer to this is it will go beautifully well with a Spanish inspired Coco Van style recipe. But what else do you think this would go really nicely with? You know, red wines in South Africa, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a no brainer. It's got to be over a braai, a nice uh, a nice, hey, even a, a kudu fillet is going to be a really, really good mix with this. Gives you that that uh, that focus um, of the acidity pulling it through, um, and that again helps pair with lighter style of dishes as well. Um, so again, uh, uh, quite a big selection of different cuisines that you can pair with something like this. So if you got the chance the to just pull in, you know, a ton of grapes from anywhere in the world in perfect condition, they've magically somehow been transported within a few hours of harvest. What would you love to really work with? There are quite a few coming to mind. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot that I'd love to work with in their native conditions. I mean, one being Cabernet Franc, the Cahors, Cabernet Franc, oh, oh, I would love to work with something like that. It's just poles apart and big acidities, big, big tannins. It's, it's, oh, it's all things I love in a good red wine. We've loved talking to you. Thank you so much for telling the story of these wines so passionately and all about uh, Maldabash and your history. Thanks, guys. Nice Take meeting care. you guys. Hello and welcome back. Uh, Caroline's pouring herself another glass of wine because it's been a bit of a stressful night at home. And, do, and, and doing uh, the dishes. And doing, do, no, Caroline's not doing dishes. We aren't, we aren't that sexy, it's awful. Um, we okay, have I'll here some dishes. delicious cheeses and um, uh, I really hope you're going to enjoy them. Um, these are quite different cheeses. Uh, they're both French. Should we talk about the wines that we just had first? Yeah, let's, let's talk about the wines. Let's okay. do that, he's, he's getting ahead right. of the game. Okay, here. so um, I should kick off because I'm going to. Um, no, because I, I was sceptical. I've got to be honest, I was pretty sceptical about, about Jamie's white. And 
Um, you know, it's, there's Puglia, a, there's you, say, you say it's got good acidity, but, but Puglia is hot. It is a hot place. It's the southern tip, the, the heel of the boot of Italy. And, and that is not normally a recipe for getting acidity, but with a native grape, I get it. And also, if it's hot and you've got richness, you can pick early. It's true. Which keeps your acidity Keep high. Yes. Yeah, we yes. Get that. Yeah, yeah, Look yeah, yeah. at that. We're, we're all know, winning not, here. Not wine maker, nothing. Um, when, when I get grapes in from Puglia, which I, I have done for the last few years, um, the one of the challenges is that you don't get to choose when you're going to pick them because the grower gets to choose when you pick them. Normally, there's a conflict of interest between the grower who wants to pick early because it's safer and the winemaker who wants to pick late because it develops the flavours more into those more ripe r tropical flavours and, and richer flavours on the red wines. Um, with, with us, I don't get that, but with a white wine, you do want to pick early, and that, for 12.5%, they've picked very early. Um, but you do normally also get a bit of a conflict because there's the rate that the sugar develops, that sort of ripeness, and there's the rate the flavours develop. But I think, and you can tell by the fact I've pretty much drunk this, I thought it was a really good pairing. I've got to say, well done, mate, that's, that's excellent. It is I'm, I'm refreshing. Very, I'm, I'm very proud of myself. Well, you should be. You know, it's, I know it's not like you're a sommelier or anything, no, but I, oh yeah, you are. If, if you thought it was great, you could give me a trophy. I, I can't give you a trophy. Shush. What? Mm. Um, but John T in the chat had a, a great note, which was that it did clear the palate between it. Um, I, I, I did find myself though, uh, quite honest, going back to that red because it is. So Good. Caroline, Caroline, she's got her hands in the air. She's, she's like actually she, got a cigarette be, license. No, because she just it. don't care. Yeah, well, I that's possible. Yeah. She cares a lot. Okay, do I do I have to give my, my opinion? You can be honest. You can be honest. No, I'm not going to be once. honest, because if I'm going to be not honest, the Vedeja is the best wine ever. Yeah. <laughs> so It's simpler. And that's why I picked it. Yep, yep, great. You're a simple uh, man. But no. Anyway, so... Oh, yeah, let's get some tasting notes in for the... Let's uh, get tasting notes in for one and four while yeah. I give my... Go my so if you've got your poly V thing over there, the, the, pop your tasting notes in for this because I said cassis and leather and tobacco and my thing. So but give me what you think. The weirder, the better. The weirder tasting notes, the better. So where I went, okay, <clears throat> the safe, easy pairing on this was Rioja, like a Rioja yeah. reserva s kind of leather, exactly, bit of oak, yeah. bit of leather, bit of smoke, bit of, and that, that, that was the... That was the easy mm. pairing. That's the that's what you should pair with that. If you Google what should I pair with chorizo and chicken, that will yeah, be a hundred answers on the Google answer, page. Yeah. The reason I went with this for Decker is is to prove the point that you can experiment, you can go against the grain, you can do something different and have a really good, interesting pairing. If I put my hands out, I think when the vote comes in, the red wine will probably get picked as either the favourite wine or the best the pairing. Best pairing. Yeah, yeah. But I think this shows that you can do something unique, that if you really, really like <clears throat> white wine, yeah. and you don't like red Go wine, because th this is a big, rich style of red wine yeah. that might not yeah. be for people who are white wine drinkers. If you're a Savignon S kind of person, yeah, that's not, not that like might that. not be your kind of wine. There's but, tannins, they're balanced, they're under control, but, but they but, are there. But, 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 <laughs> but where, where my point is going with this is the fact that you can have these big, rich dishes with chorizo and red wine, all that yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. and still enjoy a glass of white wine with it if you find the right wine that adds, gives the balance to the dish. Point proved, and it's, and it's a really important point. So the, there's a thing you've said quite often, which is drink what you like. You know, if, 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 it, it's, it, it can't be said enough experiment and drink what you like there are there are however some bad pairings in the wine world and i think perhaps this might be a good time to talk about some of those because if we're going to take wine number five which is what we're going to have with some really pongy cheese um and you're going to take that kaor you know it, even the name of it sounds a bit dirty doesn't it kaor um and well, when you a, say it like that with the facial expression that yeah, is what problems. you just call it kaor okay we're not like, even we're, we're, it, like even the south african saying but kaor it, it's a it's a big body's wine now actually wine five isn't quite as i expected it to be not how i remembered it from my youth um but you pair something that's strong intense overwhelming and coat your tongue with tannins and then you take a subtle flavoring of smoked salmon that's perhaps not the best of pairings not the best of pairings for two reasons a this is this is about a full flavored food full flavored goes with full flavor because you don't want things to hide away and get masked no um so there's that pure just full flavored if you've got a really big heavy wine 
you don't want a really, really light dish. Christ. And if you've got a really, really light wine, you don't want a really, really heavy dish. Because it's, once again, it's, it's the magical B word. Balance. balance. Yeah. Um, you've got to have that in balance. There's also... We should, we should have a, a quiz. The first person who look, does something after spotting the first mention of the word balance gets a, gets a prize or something. But anyway. <laughs> I'd rather have to two minutes past eight, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's true. Latest. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that we've got to talk about is there's, there's certain things that don't work. So tannin mm -hmm. with fishy oils yeah. doesn't bad, work. Bad combo. Tannin with that kind of green, you know, that you get in asparagus and things like mm. that, and kale. I say kale. I did all right with <laughs> did kale. Did all right with kale. But, okay, but like a Probably like wasn't that the kind, kind of salad or yeah. anything that's got vinegar. I think when we talk about those, you end up with that vinegar, yeah. that vinaigrette. So you're not going to have that kind of stuff. So vinegar and tannin Look doesn't at that. work. Tobacco, that's fantastic. Tobacco, leather, it's got that. all those kind of like tertiary awesome. characteristics. Cigars, yeah. But Brilliant. you have to go a very long way to make the wine taste really bad and the food taste really yeah. bad. Um, if you take and, a really, really spicy dish and you take something that has no flavour, but very light flavours, very sweet, uh, the very sort of, it doesn't have any kind of... But, 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 okay, so, but yeah. you're not going to make the wine taste bad. It's just not going to taste of anything. You won't, no you won't notice it. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, not, okay. it's not going to make it bad. And this is why we have a very, very yeah. spicy curry. Sometimes we'll just have a, a cold, wet, light lager. Yeah. Because you just want cold, wet, light done, you know. It's true. And the flavour of the lager goes away if there was any to start with. <laughs> um, but that, I don't want to say anything offensive at this point. But that, but that's what we that's <laughs> that's what we do. And so it's not making it bad. It's just yeah, not you just right. lose but the flavour. I, I think I've so. Told... So in that case, have a cheap wine or a cheap lager. Just 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 don't worry about it because you if you're just going for a nice, light, easy wine. Yeah, if you're having something that if you're having isn't. something that's have it cold. Me, if you're having something that's mega mega spicy, yeah. just go light, fresh, easy drinking, done. But, there's another tip about spicy food, though, isn't there? Is there? Well, I heard so. Which which one's that? I've got well, it's many about a alcohol tip. levels. Oh, that alcohol levels. Oh, thinking, that's what yeah. you want me to talk. He's trying yeah. to coax me into it. <laughs> so, if you have something spicy, it will make the alcohol in the wine taste higher. Yes. Um, which so that's completely up to you because if you like mind blowing heavy alcohol yeah. or mind blowing heavy spice, great, have high alcohol. But this well, is, it's vice versa as well because that then alcohol lowers your sort of uh, your tolerance towards the spicy food. And sometimes spicy food tastes hotter as well. So it just and, all yeah. compounds on itself. Um, but that's why we see a lot of kind of like you know low alcohol German rieslings and things mm. like that. So you have got a bit of sweetness, you have got that acidity. But the big thing is it's generally low alcohol. You've got those eight, nine, ten percent. Yeah. It's definitely not well your sixteen percent Zinfandel with a with a with a really spicy curry, no. unless you like it really spicy. In which case, do it, do but, it. But all it is is it's a bit of advice. You've got yeah. to drink what you love. You've got to enjoy what you love. Um, I've, I've probably told the story a hundred times now, so you've probably all heard it before. <laughs> but it's my story of when I went to a uh, really really fancy steak restaurant and I ordered a bottle of Oregonian Gewürztraminer and I got looked at like I'd uh, you know come from another planet. Yeah. So for those who are in Gewurz, it's a slightly sweet wine that generally comes from, you know, Alsace. This one was from the Pacific Northwest. And is that the ideal pairing for a ribeye steak? In the textbook, absolutely not. But did I want to drink that bottle of Oregon Gewurz, Shemina? Yes. Did I want to have a ribeye steak? Yes. yes. Did either of them taste bad? Was the steak delicious? Yes. Was the wine delicious? Yes. Was it a match made in heaven? Yeah. Maybe not. But I had a good time. I drank some good wine, had some good food with some good people. I, I've, got a, I've got a friend, Dan Kirby, who loves to say on any one of these Twitter conversations about food and wine pairing, what's your top advice for this? Drink what you like. And it's, it's, it's just what Jamie says. And it, there is a whole... Bit, but sommeliers are often taught, pair wine with the person, not the food. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still things that don't work better. And that's what we, we, while we're talking about things that work and don't work, it's not don't work or more often than yeah. not. It's work better yeah. or worse. Yeah. Pair, it with the you. Pair it with the diner, not the dinner. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, I see what they said there. That's good. We should move on some cheese because it's getting late. Can but we've got some questions. Oh, Ca no, Caroline has oh, a Caroline question. Caroline has a question. question. Um, I think everybody is just... Loving it. Oh, fantastic. Oh, we should, I hope beautiful. you've loved the food. The As you're asking your question, fun. let's pop on to uh, people's pairing preferences. Oh, yeah, good, good, cool. Oh, okay. Right, so. Oh, oh, but, oh, what? what? Oh, You're yeah, mad. I can't do one thing. <laughs> I can't do two things at once. The second pair. Right. Oh, okay, so there we go. So okay. you feel, fill in what you think worked better now. And so, Vedeka, Vedeka, I love you all. Can I Come ask on. a question on wine number four? Yes. Because 
I am a huge fan of casserole, mm-hmm. as you know. Um, but I get a little, on the nose, I get a little bit of mintiness or leafiness. Yeah. Or something like that. Am I going mad? No, I, I don't is, think so. Is there something quite fresh and... Is that two different is. questions? <laughs> no, I, I know I'm going mad, but... Well, that's because you work here. So, um, no, um, it's a really good point. So they, they, he talks a bit about managing this sort of, this, this herbaceousness. And there is definitely a bit of a characteristic of that. And you talked about how Cab Franc, particularly in a place like Napa or Chile or whatever, do get all of that heat. I, 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 it's funny, but while Cat Stellenbosch is really good for Bordeaux varieties, clearly he's having to work his nuts off in the vineyard to try to get the leaves, they yeah. strip the leaves off the vine to try to Cab, get more heat. Cab Franc inherently has this greenness yeah. and it needs to ripen. Um, and this is why when you have Cab Franc in Bordeaux, you have this really kind of grippy tanning kind of yeah. style when you compare it to the Merlot driven um, or the Cab, driven, Cab Sauvignon driven mm. Bordeaux. So you get this inherent greenness. When you get into the new world, everything gets bigger, bolder, richer. So those green flavors mm. can become overpowering if you're not managing your canopy correctly, if you're not managing that. Mm. So you get it either from, you know, this leafy greenness where there's overripeness and it's not balanced, or you get it because sometimes the grapes will get sunburnt. So, yes. got, so it's that balance of canopy management because if you strip all the leaves away, they get burnt and yep. you get this greenness. <laughs> yeah. If you don't strip enough away, they it get this get greenness <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult one to manage. It but is. Without that little bit of greeny leafiness, mm. it's not Cabernet Franc. No. Just drink Merlot. You know, mm. it's not as green as Cabernet Sauvignon is. It's kind of somewhere in between. But it comes down to canopy management and looking after grapes. Inherently, that's it's laborious, isn't it? It's yeah, but inherently, that's process. part of the varietal, and that's what it is. Um, and it just depends where you are in the world how intense yeah. that becomes. I'm actually so really kind of glad. Question. It wasn't a silly question. It was there an are excellent no silly question. There are no silly questions. Um, yeah, there Except are, if Alex asked me. Yeah, one. indeed. Uh, but, 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 you know, you, when you go around, um, uh, uh, we, we've done our little tour of South Africa on the Discover series, actually, uh, just a week and a half ago. And, and we've, we've tried some fantastic ones. I don't think we've had anything of that quality whatsoever, but it is quite that quality because it is hard. It's hard to do and it's rare. And that's what we love to do on the Adventure series is introduce you to wines which are smaller batch, like, you know, who makes who makes three thousand bottles of things? And it's know, got a bit of age. It's, it's twenty sixteen. It's got got a couple of years on that. But. Yeah, um, brilliant wine. Really love it. Um, but we should move on to some cheese because it's getting on in the night. And we should, we should, look, at, we should look at cheese. We should have a look at what people like. Yeah, but we can. Let's let's we can flick through Poly V as to what people we like can. while but we let's do that. Get, we let's get summarize. wines five and six into the glass. And again, we have gone for quite different wines. Now, what you will have noticed, perhaps, if you're very astute, is that Jamie has picked three white wines for the night, but his last white wine is sweet. Now, Jamie, being American, has a bit of a sweet um, tooth. They're like I, Twinkies. I was and... not astute. I had not actually considered that all my wines were white tonight. <laughs> I thought you had. I, thought... I, I just picked up on that. How about that? Well, that, that's funny, isn't it? But <laughs> he's clearly not astute, as he says. But I have decided to go on a very different direction. Um, and I, my, my cheese, I apologise for the state of your fridge, if you had this, <laughs> this cheese in your fridge. Because anyone who has been here since we first bought some cheeses to try to work out what we were going to pair it with, it has been a little bit pungent. So the, the, Well, to, to the point that we thought, you know, because these cheeses last, they've got a bit of age on them. So we bought two sets going... We'll, we'll taste one, we'll pick the wines, and then we'll keep the other one till the tasting <laughs> night. And then we that were like, the wrong choice. Nope, no, we have to eat the cheese and order another one to arrive the day before the tasting because otherwise we cannot work here. But the line on this, it's not so much about the best pairing for the cheese plate as such because we've both selected yeah, they're, the cheese they're two out different of that cheeses, box. Yeah. The, Alex has gone with the uh, Saint Marcelin. And I've gone with the Briat Savran to put a wine with it. Try both wines with both cheeses. Would lo- okay. Would love your opinion. Yeah. Because that's, you, 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 well, you'll get you, a different. Ne- ex- you never know what tasty treats you might find. Um, and and if think- we, we the, the irritating thing is that actually because of the cheeses we picked, um, we probably would have gone for Jamie's cheese first and then my cheese, but 
because of the wines. Because of the wines. We're going to go to go red, red than dessert. We're going to go the red than dessert. But go backwards and forwards. Have some fun. Yeah, have a, have a bit of play. So, anyway. It's all a bit of fun, isn't it? You want to talk a bit about your cheese and let's, your wine? Let's talk about the cheese. Right, so... Uh, Saint Marcel. Oh, um, do you want to? Can we? Do you want to do, do a cheese shot so people can see? see oh, people yeah, can see we can see the cheese. That. Oh, if that Look still good. works, that, that might. Look at that! Oh my God, it's worked. I'll put Bloody your bottle hell, there, and that. I'll put that bottle there, and that's. Let's get all the mold out of the way. Holy moly! Goodness me! Multiple One day people shots. think we know what we're talking about. Yeah. Shame about the wine stains. Shame about the wine. Well, it's not because that's part of the character of this table. It has grown with us and and is we, scarred we, we like should, us. We should label them. So. Um, if you go Clo to Hedonism in London, they've got a table down the bottom that's got all these wine stays matched on. That's well, we're cool. Going, right? Well, we are going one, at one some day. Point. One day. <laughs> so, Saint Marcel. It's from the Rhone Alps. So, as you start to move into the foothills of the Alps, uh, it, it's uh, it is probably to me the classic pongy French cheese. It is. It is, and, and I've had one from Waitrose, which is not as pongy. So if you've got that one, it's still delicious, but it's not the full effect. It's, it's, it's a moderated down version. It's the sort of, uh, you know, and, and it's, it, it's still lovely, but <clears throat> all of this brought me back to my childhood again. And when I say childhood, I mean sort of late teens, obviously. His days of clothes are No, my days of, in <laughs> fact, Kaor. And that is why we are back down there. And so, isn't that what, the place where you go and do the booze run in Calais? No. Oh, that's Carrefour. That's Carrefour, ah. which is a great French super chain. I'm going to stop. You've got. You've got I've to stop with your to accents. I've been told to stop the accents. I've been you... told it's xenophobic. I don't. I love the French. They're great. Um, um, anyway, so we we as a family often uh, would drive down to the south of France for our summer holidays, like, like many people did, um, and. Uh, it was at a leisurely pace, and my mother's going to be watching this tomorrow night, so she won't mind if I say that she is the slowest driver on the entire known planet. So, it would take us a few days, so we'd have to stop in places like Clos Rougeau on the way. It was practicalities that we're talking about, it's not snobbery. We would end up in rural, non unsnobby France, where they drink rough and ready wines, and they eat rough and ready foods. And this, to me, is a taste of that. It's a taste of the villagers all coming together in the square and having a festival. And it is it is a wonderful thing. We went to this thing called Le Mishui, which um, uh, was down there. So Kao is on the lot, I believe. I hope I've got that right. And a tributary of the lot is called the Sile, and that goes to a place like Fijac. And uh, our little village that we'd often stay down was just down the Sele. And we would come together in the square, the cloisters of an old monastery. And everybody would have French onion soup, a hearty dish with these big baguette cut croutons with smelly cheese on top of them, all grilled and with hearty local wine. That was all Malbec or Cabernet Franc. So there is a bit of a link back to the previous one, just like... Uh, just like Henry said, oh, no, no, I'm about to Frenchify him. But this is, a koa is tannin. It is power. It is heat. It is, it is rough and ready. It is not an elegant wine. But what I I'm fascinated about when I found this one was that they have started to bring in some of the most sort of gentle and careful techniques that you'll find in the winemaking world that are, so they are 100% biodynamic which involves basically saying goodbye to modernity doesn't it you, you can't use a you can't use a pesticide to kill your weeds you have to you, you can't have you can't use a tractor they use donkeys to gently plough down the sides. You've got to pick the when the moon looks right exactly. at you. Exactly. It's all about phase of the moon. It's all about all sorts of things. It's borderline religion, frankly. But they they have gone all in on this, but with the classic grape varieties. And they're creating a varietal wine, and it's from Kaur. And I think you should try this wine without any cheese first, because it is tannic. But it's not as bad as many... It's big, it's chewy, it's grippy, it screams, I must have food. This isn't something you would sit mm. idle up to a, uh, you know, a little wine bar tasting room and go, oh, I'm going to have two glasses of this no. cahor because half a glass through, like palate fatigue, you're just going to be like, yeah. uh, I can't talk it anymore because it just, it's too chewy. So what you have to do with a wine like that, that's that chewy, is coat your tongue with something that is salty and cheese has salt in it and is fatty. And this cheese here, has that, but it also has, you talked about balancing flavours. 
That's a strong flavoured cheese. This is a strong flavoured wine. So that's why I want to have this cheese with this wine. Go on, man. And that I'm going to... Well, I haven't got my uh, cutter, so... Just stick a cracker in it. Where are the crackers? Oh, there in, is a cracker. In the oh, middle. See, so you can do that. It's uh, uh, fine. It's fine. That's, that's good. No, got it. I, I've got I've it. Got We're it. all good. We're all good. So I'm going to have a bit of that. Couple of questions. Mm. Dive in. Um, Simone, Simone says, uh, what are the English versions for these cheeses because oh. they don't have any French cheeses? Wow. Good um, question. That is a very good question. <laughs> and... <laughs> I would love to have an answer for you. If you want an answer, if because uh, I believe yes. you're you're local to us. Simone, drop us an email or come in. No, call, call our friends call at number up. two pound street because they will say, say you've had the San Marcin, say you've got the Briat Savon, and they will give you a identical kind of uh, kind of link to it. And I've got to say, in, English cheeses, English cheeses are up and coming. Well, I say up and coming, they've been making for centuries. Yeah. Some really, really good stuff. And there's so many things that we we make in England that are the same as you know their counterparts around the world. One of my favourites, if you're if you're a Camembert fan, there's a cheese called Tunworth, which is Camembert style but blows Camembert out of the water. Ooh. I don't have an answer for a straight swap on these. Um, you know the the Briat Savran is a triple cream brie style cheese. So if you know a big, rich, soft brie style, um, you know maybe down from Somerset or somewhere like that, that might be a thing. Um, the San Marcelin, I'm not aware and. If I had a better I've answer, never I'd give seen you a better answer. Anything but, um, from England. But a stinky Bishop, maybe. Stinking Bishop, stinky maybe. Bishop, yeah. Um, um, but um, how smooth is that? Try that cheese, try the wine. It's suddenly smooth. And you've just got this concentrated cherry flavour. He's delicious. excited by this, Perry. I love he? it. I'm he really is. excited by this. So, another question from John T. Okay. Um, his wife is asking what wine pairs best with a blue cheese. Oh, I'm guessing you're going ah. to say port. No. no. Oh. <laughs> so, but you've given him a brilliant chance to say the story. So, uh, I'm going to have a bit of cheese first while I can. So, I'm going to say while he's having his cheese, I'm going to say Canadian red berry ice wine. Now, that's a strange thing. I'm staring at Caroline. So, oh my goodness, I know. I'm in. Yeah, it's so good. It's also 120 pounds for half a bottle, but I, I've never had as good a bearing as that. It was. Amazing, absolutely amazing. What what is it? What's the berry that's in the inner skillin? Um, Cab Franc. It is. It's not. It's Cab Franc. It's a Cabernet Franc ice wine. <laughs> by inner I'm in. All right, I'm going to get it. Um, I'll bring the cheese if you buy the wine. <laughs> Deal. So he's getting a bit all overexcited. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about food and wine pairing because there's a there's a lot of standard Jeez. things. Do you want to switch to the other thing so I can focus it? Or you could just put it, put it, put it on the table shop. Table shop. Switch to it. by the cheese. Oh, there we go. There we are. Cabernet Franc ice wine, one hundred and twenty pounds for a half bottle. Half a bottle. Are we opening it now, Alex? No, uh, no. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Can, can I? Are you doing this so no one likes my dessert wine? No, nope. you're making my dessert wine inferior. Is that your game plan? <laughs> Long. Anyway. But back, back to blue cheese and wine, back to blue cheese and wine. There's a lot of things that go and run around and people go, oh, this goes with this and this goes with that and that goes with the other. And I think Stilton and Port is what people find as a classic pairing. It is good. It's really it, good. It is good, but do you know why? He knows why, because I told I him do. earlier, he told so me, he yeah. can't feign I didn't know why until you told me earlier. Do you know why Port and um, blue cheese go together? No, I hate blue cheese. So, <laughs> back in the day... <laughs> We tried to move cheese all around the world, yes? yes? On ships, and it was warm, and it was nasty. What happened to the cheese? It, it rotted. Naughty. It grew maggots inside. Yeah, you open the cheese up, there was maggots in there. Not, not So, okay. what could you do? What, what, what else were we shipping all around the world? Alcohol. Alcohol. So, if we dug a hole in the middle of the port, cut the... Not the port. The cheese, the cheese. Cut the cheese open, put that... Filled it with port in the inside. Fortified that wine. That fortifies it, so therefore preserves it. So... They found that brandy helped red wine. Probably after, cross. after, probably after that, yeah. because it was you know port was the port proper. was going around. It was all they already had a barrel of it on the ship. So so, yeah. so they were putting port mad into the wheels of cheese <gasps> to stop them going to off. stop them going Fantastic. off. Fantastic. So therefore, when story. it got to the other end, you opened it up and you had your port and your cheese, and that's why it was a classic pairing. So I'm not saying it's not a good pairing. It is a good but pairing. It's, it's a good pairing. It's not. It's not a. It's, it's a pairing for history. It was a pairing yeah. for necessity, 
rather than a pairing for flavouring, which that? is really quite interesting. Come on, your cheese, dude. Well, it's late. <laughs> is it? <laughs> poor people are wanting to go yes, home. It's quarter to ten. Oh, my word, last, my word. Last chance. Right, my last chance. Time to shine. Let's have a bit of this. So, we are going to French cheese, triple cream brie called Briat Savaran, named after Mr. Briat Savaran, the, uh, the French gourmand. He wrote books in the 1800s. Um, mm. He has a cheese named after him. He's also got, if you're a baker, a the Savaran mould that makes the little round cakes. Oh, okay. That is also named after him. So a bit of a, a bit of a legend in the culinary industry. Um, so this triple cream brie is named after him. It has to be at least 72% fat. So it's big, it's rich. For me, it's just creamy. It almost tastes like vanilla ice cream. It is phenomenal. Um, that is decadent, example. it is rich, it is phenomenal. That's so good. So there's two ways you can go with this. You can go all the way back to the thing and do a very kind of like high acid, fresh Riesling to cut through all that fattiness. But I've gone the other way and I've gone to Australia because uh, I may or may not have a slight obsession with Australian <laughs> wine, if those who know me. And this is from Taubilk. And this is just outside, about 80 miles outside of Victoria, the Nagambi Lakes. Um, and Taubilk um, started in 1860. And it's, um, its name is Aborigine. It means um, Talbot, it came from the name Talbot Talbot, which is many watering holes in oh. Aborigine. So that's kind of where it comes from. Um, but it was built, uh, it was um, purchased oh, by the Purbrick family in 1925, I want to say. So they're now fifth generation winemakers. And this is the oldest plots of Marsan in the world. No one else has uh. older Marsan than this. No phylloxera, no anything. Oldest be, been planted since 1860, this Marsan. Um, and this is their cane cut done as a dessert wine. So it's got a bit of age of it, it's 2014. And what they do is they they start fermenting it and then they drop the temperature down. So they basically cold, basically shock shock it with cold. So it mm. stops, stops fermenting. Um, and this sits with a minuscule 128 grams per <laughs> litre sugar. So you've got this beautiful richness, this beautiful sweetness that goes with this beautiful, rich, beautiful, mm. almost mm. sweet style of cheese. A little bit of age to it, 2014, so you've got this little touch of nuttiness to it. And I just think it's... Is it a perfect pairing? I'm taught, but it's decadent and over the top and everything I think a wine and cheese pairing should be for the end of an evening. The, the standard the standard pairing for this, as I've read this, uh, tonight, is champagne or Prosecco and... and um, I, I think they're missing something, as it almost turns into a cheesecake in your mouth, especially with a, with a good cracker on it. It's, it is a dessert course when you pair it with that. Um, and if you compare that 120 grams of sugar to uh, an English dessert wine we were drinking the other night, which had 43 grams of sugar. Dry. Can I just say, yeah? Californian white Zinfandel has 45 grams. Wow. Californian white Zinfandel has 45 grams. So if you're having Not your blush Zin, Zinfandel. Caroline will know all about that from her days in uh, in the commercial wine industry. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's some great uh, tasting out there. A lot of right? richness, a lot of honey, a lot of, uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful drop of wine. To me, your pairing, um, if I just work on which I prefer all night long, it's yours. Yours is really cool. Mine's a lot more rustic. And, but actually, I would just say that if you're, if we're talking about the subject of in wine pairing, academically, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a two fun and different principles being demonstrated here. I love that wine. I love that cheese. I love the way they come together and change each other. And it's that, that concept that, that that fattiness changes the tannins there. But with that, you've got how the sweetness and acidity changes that creamy cheese. And that, that's, so I don't know how you decide between those two. And thankfully I don't have to, but really cool. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun experiment. I've really enjoyed it. It has been fun. I know it's so, been a quieter tasting so, for us. You know, we, you know we, we've run through it and I know we're getting a bit late in the day, but any final questions, any final thoughts? And we need to yeah. get in uh, the picks for... What did you like? Yeah, what did I, you enjoy? <clears throat> I'm almost hopeful that there might be some questions actually, uh, some answers coming in. I don't I know. Have, I have got one thing to add. Okay. One thing to add. One little thing to add. Because 
Can we reveal the prices before people vote for their no. phone? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Fine. No, we don't do no. that on this thing. That's I'm unfair. just, we, I'm we just are... seeing if I can have a bonus yeah, he, point. He wants to there. get a bonus point. But, um, so there are some, uh, some, I think the so last, you know, some there are points. some interesting Some points. interesting points that might make you reconsider your decisions. Unless, of course, you think I'm great and then you don't need to reconsider anything. Um, but any final thoughts or questions on yeah, that? Yeah, please, help? please let us no, know. And so, no. Do, so, do we want to pop through to the Poly V for, for favourite pairings of the night? I don't, I don't think that... Hang on, I'll try. I don't think that is... Oh, if you go back to the previous slide, I think... Um, no I just don't know where the response slides are. That's no. strange. Well, let me go on to... Uh, okay. As always, the technology. What okay. we need is a person. We need a tech, a tech person. person. Okay, can everyone just jump into the chat? And the, the third chat. pairing, that is the slide. If you go on now, it should be, as long as the third pairing is active, that has all of the questions in it. So I hope that, uh, I hope that, that will go live. It's live. It's live. People are filling it in. Bless you. Well done. We Fantastic. Perfect. So people can answer that. Um, but we, we did want to ask the question because we don't want to do this every session, of course. It's far too much faff. But I love cooking. But we all do love cooking. At home. And, uh, at home. And not where, where I've got the right of... kit to do it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, but there are, there are various different options to us. We, we're certainly we're going to be doing more things with food and cheese. We, we, we are going to be working with Pong Cheese in August. Um, and that's going to be great. Fingers crossed. Uh, well, hopefully we'll basically pair our tasting to their August pack. And so you'll get to try some some cool things, but we could be doing it with 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 some simple little things like hams and cheese or nuts and crackers and snacks and cheese and monster munch even. Maybe we can pouch up some monster munch for people. Other but other brands of crisps other brands are available. Of crisps available. <laughs> We're not the BBC. We don't have to do that. <laughs> I just keep having to remind myself. But um, but yeah. So we, we we could do those things, and we thought maybe once a year we might like to do this again. But not no more than that. But do let us know in the survey what you think, whether you'd like to do something like this and more, more sort of pairings. and uh, Or if you just want to drink, frankly, we totally get that. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic. So two very last things to go through. Um, yeah, you haven't done the spice and the... No, not that. Oh, not on okay, that. I, I, I did spice with the chorizo. All right, fine. So um, anyone who's a member with us, Cherry will be in, in touch with you in the next yes. uh, week or so. We've got lots of people to get through. Um, we if, hope you haven't been too overwhelmed by your double packs this we've, we've <laughs> sent, we've sent, We've sent the new packaging out. I hope you like it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think some of you saw it on Eastern yeah. European last year. We, we just didn't want to shortchange month. anybody who'd bought a, a couple's pack and then felt that they so got we, something So we are, we are moving to one size only. So it will be those 75 mil times six. Um, so if so, this month we sent, and that will be that thirty nine ninety five yeah. price discounted as previous four subscription, all that kind of stuff. So yeah. if you were if you had joined as a couple, we sent you two packs. So that was thirty nine ninety five times two. So we sent that to you yeah. for whatever Eight your current of the pack. so for whatever your current subscription price was. So you could kind of see what we were doing. We didn't want you to have any less wine, but then make that decision. Do you want to spend a little bit more money, handle loads of wine each? or you're happy with one yeah. pack to share. But Cherry will be in touch with everyone to kind of she talk will. through and, that. And there, there will be a special discount available for those who are do who are current members who do want to have two packs each month because we, we, are, we, aren't, we, aren't, we aren't total we, swines. We'd like to have two packs We'd like to have month, two packs, but, so but equally, um, the, 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 the sensible way, we, we had so many people get in touch with us. We did a survey and we said, what, what, what do you feel about the current amount? We had so many people going, actually, we're a couple and we share a, a single pack of the old one with 50% less wine, and that's too much for us to drink in the midweek. And we've, we sometimes forget that not everyone drinks as much as we do. So, <laughs> which, is, which is a fair thing to I'm say. Glad, I'm glad we clarified uh, that. that. Uh, so, yeah. But I hope you like the new packaging, and that's coming, which we can change it. Next month, next month, next month is England. So, oh, there's, yeah. there's two English tastings. Um, anyone who's on Adventurers, we are doing what we feel, we say premium English. We can't yeah. say the best of English because we cannot get the best of English into six wines. Um, but we are getting out and about and touring around and we're going to actually be in the vineyards meeting the people yep. and stuff like that. So that's going to be kind of fun. However, be great. if you're on Adventures and fancy doing something a little bit different as well, on the 9th, our Discoverer series, we're doing mm. England versus the yeah. world. So we're doing three wines from England against a counterpart of a similar style and a similar price point from somewhere else in the world. The wines 
on the Discovery series are different from the wines on the Adventure Completely. series. Completely, not a single overlap. So there's no overlap. So if you, it's not, oh, we've got the same wines and I've already had yep. that. It'll be very, very different. And, you know, it's, it's, it's Welsh Wine Week, it's English Wine Week next month. So we're, we're really excited to get out and support, you know, what we're doing in, in the UK. So hopefully you want to dive yeah. in and join us. Um, and we'll be going to the vineyard. So the, the, that we're not reliant on whatever marketing videos that we can find. We're filming ourselves, and so that's going to be brilliant. And we'll be talking to the people, and it's just so much more fun when you're talking to the winemakers to, because it's then it's, it's a different it's, different it's, level of story. But anyway, do we want? Oh, one more question. Yes, from okay. Peter, um, P Peter Davidson. Peter I don't Davidson. Think it's the good doctor, Peter Davidson. Oh, no, um, no. Is the Savaran meant to taste bitter? No, I wouldn't have thought really. so. It no, should, it should be it's very much rich, creamier and... very creamy, okay. very decadent. Um, no, I might mind. Uh, so, it. whoever you bought it from, I might have a word with them I about that. Chat, yeah, chat, yeah. Oh, he thinks this one is wrong. No, yes. I would say that that's yeah. that's it, reasonable. It should be very rich, very creamy. Um, mine, I I, des I described mine the first time I I had this one that we got from Pong Cheese. Is it tastes like vanilla ice cream? Um, it right. should be really rich. You shouldn't have any sourness or bitterness in 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 okay. that. Unfortunately, you should so, yeah, not. Fun. Yeah. So sorry, you've had a uh, yeah. Not, that doesn't not, sound not great. Right cheese. At my apologies all. for that. Oh my gosh. So I don't know if Caroline can see this, but oh my goodness me, I've got some results here for you. Oh, he's got what? he's got them on his phone. What? Bloody what Nora. What do they mean? Wow. Okay. So uh, the favourite pairing out of the last two cheeses was Jamie by a vast margin. And I, I get that, I get that. I think mine was really interesting, but actually did yours end up being really interesting as well, and yours is better, so fair, fair play, absolutely fair. The wine of the night, and this is an utter, utter shocker. So actually at this point, Caroline, can you put the prices up? Oh, it's not. What's the wine of the night? It's not, is it? It's not. The it Vendetta. is. Wine number three, the Vedeca, <laughs> the cheapest wine, under ten pounds by a country mile. By uh, so that is that is very impressive. The second was the Cabernet Franc, and uh, do you know what? Actually, price adjusted. That's a, 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 a wine six was the third favourite, um, and then it was a tie between the Sancerre and the Cochu, which I think is wonderful because they were actually both good in their they own ways. They were both great, and they both yeah. did slightly different things with the pairings. And Okay. It, came in the, Carl, it, it came in the top Carl, six. Carl came fourth. Carl came fourth. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, um, but, uh, and it was split between the first two. So, um, should we do it again? 56% uh, of people love to do this once a year or so. 31% um, would love to do something like cheese and ham. Uh, but 13% would like to drink. And that's fine. So, brilliant. And 100% of people have had a good night. So, thank oh, you so much. Did you put in who's uh, was it? So, did I win then? You did. Congratulations, hey! Dave. Who would have thought it? Than... You know, mate, uh, the, the, fair play. The, the Somme. <laughs> well, Somme won in a food and wine matching competition. I'm glad for you. It, no, it, it's, it's I, 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 just, I just think this That's shows a, that... That is a cool... You've I done was, a cool thing a, I was that. umming and ahhing with this, and I just it, it just shows that get... get Try a different grape. Try yeah. something different. Try it. Um, I don't know how many people would have just walked in and bought a, you know... A Vedeca. Would have just walked in and bought a Vedeca. There you go. No, this oh, one. this one. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. Don't. And oh, well, Yeah. Um, They've got a good but, but, but these guys across the board, like if you like their stuff, get some Vedeca, get some Negro Mara, get yeah, some cool Primitivo. They're, they're cool. cool guys. They make good wine and offer really good value for money. So Absolutely. Um, but without, I mean, that's, that's, uh, it's been a fun night. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for standing by us while we had a couple of little techie gremlins as usual. But I, no. I, 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 I'm so delighted that so many of you cooked along. I hope you've had a wonderful night and a delicious meal and some cool wines. And we might, we might be in a new studio next month. Well, yeah. possibly. We'll be in a new warehouse and a we'll new be, factory for we'll, sure. But we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll be somewhere. We'll be somewhere. But, anyway, but anyway, we will be here with you and we're going to have a, another great night with six cool wines. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed Drink it. Drink wine. Tell Drink your wine. friends. See us again soon. Take care. Good night. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>